If your only definition is more is better than less, and then you give people the opportunity to visibly do work at every moment of their life, those two things don't play well together. Yeah. And I think that's why we get this burnout epidemic that just starts in the early 2000s and it just goes, 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 goes. And then the pandemic sort of pushes people over the edge and they're saying enough. There's a Latin expression, you probably know it. You know, Festina Lente? Yeah. I wrote about it. Is it in the book? I, I don't didn't know if see it's it. in the book. Uh, I wrote a, an essay about it, though. Someone sent it to me. Okay, yeah, this is very Ryan Holiday. What's the Emperor Hadrian's favorite expression? I looked up all the different extant artwork. Yeah. The Festiva Lente artwork, all the different diagrams, the, the, the pictures that people would use for it. It means make haste slowly. I, yeah. I, I thought of, that's the essence of the idea of slow productivity, right? Yeah. Which is that sometimes rushing is the slowest way to do it and sometimes going slowly is the fastest way to do it yes exactly see i think i came across it after i wrote the book oh really yeah so i was like this is <laughs> it yeah yeah this is it i was like man we could have had this right up front i could have been talking about hadrian it'd be yes. great yeah well no you th you think that cramming it all in or like working very hard in it on it is going to be the deciding variable but oftentimes it's like it's a singular idea or a breakthrough or a new way of looking at it that solves the whole problem or allows you to go forward. So if you don't yeah. have that, there was no point in doing any of the things before. And then also, once you have that, things tend to go very quickly. Well, also this idea that you can throw a lot of busyness at something, mm -hmm. that's modern. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's not, this is why in the book I do a lot of older stories because, you know, my contention is look at people who use their brain to create things historically. Yeah. They tended to have a huge amount of autonomy and flexibility. Yeah. Which meant they could experiment. Like what works, what doesn't work if I'm Galileo, if I'm Mary Curie, if I'm George O'Keefe, I have flexibility. So what works, what doesn't work? They can figure that out. Right? Yeah. Then you can isolate those ideas and say, how do we adapt these now to, you know, like a modern world, modern jobs. But if you go back and study these traditional knowledge workers, the idea that you would just be, getting after it in yeah. a sort of modern 2020s email all day long, let's hop on call since, just didn't compute. They took their time. Yeah. Right? They were making hay slowly because when you zoomed out, their production was incredibly impressive. Yeah. When you zoomed in, they would look by modern standards like they're lazy. Well, yeah, it seems like uh, they're laying on their back looking at the trees yep. or they're taking long lunches or long walks and this all seems like it's not work. Yeah. But if, if in doing that you have the idea that unlocks the the work or allows you not to burn out while doing the work yeah. or you have the conversation that inspires, you know, th that's where the work is being done. And sometimes just the time required, it's not even a breakthrough, just to mature something. Yeah. Right? I mean, this is Lin-Manuel Miranda, his first play in The Heights, right? Which which is a little overshadowed, but it won eight Tonys, right? <laughs> a big deal play. Yeah. yeah. He first wrote that in college. He was a, a sophomore at Swarthmore. He put it on, right? It wasn't very good, mm -hmm. that first version. It took him seven years from there to it actually having its debut on the stage. And if you look at those seven years, he was working on it steadily, but not intensely. So they would huh. come back to it. He was working with a couple of alums from Swarthmore who had a, a theatrical company. And what they would do is, on a regular basis, we're going to bring in actors, and we're going to read your latest version of the book. Yeah. Uh, but then a couple months will go by and then we're going to bring him back. So you have to keep working on it. Yeah. Keep maturing this. But he was also doing a lot of other things, right? He was touring with his freestyle rap group, Love Supreme. <laughs> he was writing a restaurant column, he was substitute teaching. Uh, but he had to take that time because he was 22. Right? Yeah. Like, like he wasn't ready. If he just said, I'm going to just go after it. I'm going to go into debt, spend six months after college. Let's make this play work. It wouldn't have worked. He yeah. needed seven years coming back to it again and again as he matured creatively, the play matured. And then when it was ready to go, uh, it really popped off. And then it was a really quick year of development and this thing was on Broadway. In Discipline is Destiny, I contrast these two Civil War generals. Uh, there's George McClellan, who was yep. sort of always preparing. He said he never had enough supplies. <laughs> never fought, though. <laughs> yeah, and, and he, would never, he would never sort of do the thing. Yeah. He, was, he, would, he would get started, he'd start moving, and then there'd be some breakdown. It would take him like five days to cross a river. He, he, uh, Lincoln said he's got the slows, right? And so, so you would think, you know, like his, uh, the contrast would be like the one who's always aggressive, always moving. And it is, but I was really interested in this General George Thomas, 
who they called him Old Slow Trot. And he was seemingly slower than McClellan right. in a lot of ways. Yep. But when he was preparing or revving up, he was actually doing that. Yeah. Right? McClellan was using it as an excuse. He, he, he didn't actually believe he could win once he was in motion. He was hoping... He kept believing there would be this one singular decisive battle that would decide everything. And then also, I think, deep down, he he didn't actually want the North to win the Civil War. He wanted some sort of negotiated settlement that would preserve slavery. But but the, the point is, it was all kind of for show. Yeah. And then he didn't have like he he, he didn't have the 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 killer instinct to finish the thing. And and old slow trot uh, General Thomas, he was equally if not slower to get going but once he got going he didn't stop and i I think that's sometimes we when we look at artists or whatever go they're just like procrastinating or thinking or planning and they actually could be doing that that might be what they're doing so there's a difference between this like sort of like oh i'm just waiting for all the conditions to be right and then the person who actually is not saying i'm waiting for the conditions to be right but like making the right conditions and then when they have everything they need it actually happens yeah i like the metaphor Right. Yeah. yeah. You you you're making progress towards the objective. It might be slow, but it's actually progress. And that's yeah. Lin Manuel Miranda. If we go back yes. to that example, he wasn't just sitting there in those seven years thinking, "I'm going to get, I'm, I'm letting it marinate, but yeah. like one day soon, you know, I'm going to write this play and make it right." He was working. Like they kept doing different shows, and they would. Uh, this is goes through a lot of the different stories. Yeah. Pretty systematically figuring out what's not working. Yeah. Like we tried this, this is not working. How do we fix that? Like what unlocked that particular play was Miranda was good at the music. They're doing something innovative with the music, but the book wasn't very good. Mm. And they eventually brought in another playwright and she was fantastic. She went on to win her own uh, Pulitzer in 2012 for a completely different play. They brought in the talent when they figured out Oh, right. this isn't what was working, right? Then he met his music director. Okay, now things are really starting to. But you, uh, you don't get there unless you're, you're. I'm slowly but steadily. Let's try. Yeah. This isn't working. Let me try that. That is working. Oh, let me do a little bit more. Oh, this is a little bit short. Well, what's the best way to fix? It? Well, let's find out. This might take us yeah. a year to figure out how does one fix this. So you never stop. But I like slow trot as a metaphor. Uh, you could be going what seems to be slowly in the moment but you're advancing on that territory bit by bit yeah there's a lot of people who have been working on a play for seven years yes and it's exactly the same as it was when they started yes and and uh yeah there's a difference between working and working yeah well i mean i use myself as an example i i decided when i was 20 all right what am i going to do computer science writing Mm -hmm. right um and and i sort of knew what that what that meant what i wanted that to be my entire 20s are just slow trot, right? It's, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm writing uh, paperback original books that, yeah. that aren't at the time making a big splash, but I'm honing the craft. I'm in grad school, right? Yeah. So everyone goes to grad school, but yeah. I'm, I'm honing the craft, right? Sure. It's not really till I get to 30 that anything I think that would be impressive to the outside world happens. My first sort of real hardcover idea book, uh, front table book, is comes out when I'm 30. I get my hired as a professor when I'm 30, yeah. right? So it's it's 10 years. I never stopped right. writing the next book. I'd take it on magazine commissions where I would try to polish specific writing skills I thought I wanted to improve, trying to, pub, you know, as an academic, I'd build those skills, publish new papers, now try to publish papers that win awards. It's slow and steady. Right. Uh, nothing flashy. You know, I wasn't getting involved in other new media. I waited to get involved in new media until after all of that was established. <laughs> sure. I wasn't starting companies. I was, you know, I just... I took that 10 years and then after that 10 years, oh, things are kind of clicking and interesting, you know, interesting options begin to pop up. But what's weird about that is it's sort of the same contrast you mentioned earlier, which is like it, day to day, it doesn't look like they're being productive, but then you look at the output and very clearly they were. Yeah. So you're like my twenties, I'm just, blah, blah, blah. it's slow. But then like to be a professor at 30 is an accomplishment in and of itself <clears throat> to publish your first book by 30 in and of itself like people like you're so young right so there's this weird thing where it doesn't seem like you're being productive or you're uh at you know operating quickly or or sort of beating the curve but then when the results come in it actually does look that way so it's this it's this weird it's this weird contrast where uh yeah the the day-to-dayness of it you can't see where it's leading but it is leading where you want it to go i mean it's a time scale issue Right. What does that like, mean? Like, what time scale am I measuring productivity on? Mm. So, when you say uh, 
I'm measuring productivity in my 20s on the decade time scale. Like I want to look back at my 20s and yeah. say, I'm proud of what I did in my 20s. Yeah. That makes a random Tuesday seem a lot different yeah. than if your productivity time scale is like this week, I want to get after it. Yeah. Right? So if that's your time scale, like I better fill today. And then you're going to start coming up with activities that's going to yeah. allow you to be busy, right? Because I need to be productive today. So, okay, if I uh, add this into my life and that into my life and have a bunch of coffees with other people and go through all these ideas, then I'm going to feel productive on the daily scale. But when right. you get to the 10 year scale, you're going to say, eh, you know, I had a lot of sort of like ventures and things and this and that, and then nothing really added up. So, I mean, a lot of this, it's a time scale issue. I was thinking about that the other day. It was my was dropping my son off at school and it was sort of taking longer than usual. And I started, I like, I like to be like sitting at the desk and writing by like nine ish and, and by nine ish, I mean like nine. Yeah. And so like, it was like, okay, this is going to be one of those like nine fifteen, like yeah. nine thirty days because this thing that's out of my, and so I started to feel like not insecure, but I felt like rushed or, or, anxious about like I have to get this thing over so I could do this other thing because it can't be late whatever and yeah. then I was like okay but what if I instead of thinking about this like today like what time am I supposed to be sitting there writing what if I just think about where I'm going to be at the end of having written the book and I won't be sweating whether I was there five minutes earlier 10 minutes earlier yeah 20 minutes later even if I skip today entirely and I just you know decide to do this family thing and so that was like helpful it's like okay that it just let, let me turn down the stakes here and just think about it in light of a larger time scale. Yeah. At the same time, that's also the logic that people who don't get things done yeah. tell themselves. They go, oh, today doesn't matter. Yeah. Like uh, the, the, the goal I set in my head or the, the commitment I made, it doesn't matter. And so it's, it, I think it's a, it's a tricky balance for people because you can say like, look at it in terms of decades that's also a way to let yourself off the hook right now. Yeah, but I think this is the key challenge of doing impressive work, right? So if you doubt your ability at this moment yeah. to be able to balance those two things, tomorrow doesn't matter, but what I do this month does, right? Like, mm -hmm. like a typical writer's yeah. mindset, yeah. right? It doesn't matter if I can't write tomorrow as long as I write enough this month. If, if sure. that feels like it's going to be a challenge, you're not ready to be going after what you're doing. And now there's, huh. there's ways you build up to get ready for it. So it, you know, it's why one of three principles in the book is obsess over quality, yeah. which at first feels a little bit orthogonal to slow productivity. The other things are directly connected to pace and, and workload, right. but it's actually critical for all the other things to happen because if you train yourself to understand what's quality in my field, you systematically work on your craft, you, you build that obsession with quality, you don't have the problem of, I'm not able to write today, and I'm gonna use right. this as an excuse, because you're obsessed with, I wanna write something really good. Yeah. You know, This is what I do. What What's gonna make me happy is having finished this chapter this month. You feel, you probably feel the same way I do. When I can't write for a few days, uh, there's a compulsion of like, yeah, I like can't wait up. to get back yeah. and like the, the work sure. on this. And so I put that in the book, because this, I think, is a problem a lot of people face. If you just jump right into, like, I'm going to be the greatest whatever, and yeah. now you're procrastinating all the time, that might be an honest signal from your brain, which is like, we're not really ready to do this. Yeah, I find that, like, if, if, I, if I'm, like, what they call writer's block, like, when I'm sitting down and I'm like, I don't know what to do today, or I don't know what to say, it's really that I just haven't done the research. Like, if I, if I have found... If I have gathered the materials necessary to do the thing, yeah. doing the thing is easy. Yeah. When I am, I have, uh, I have t taken shortcuts or phoned it in or, um, you know, rushed things. Then I'm like, I don't know, like that. Yeah. That so so Stephen Pressfield obviously talks about the resistance. Sometimes it's not the resistance. Sometimes it is a signal that your intuition is picking up yep. that there's a less fun part of the process that you have to go back to first. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right, right. Uh, it, it's a way your mind is saying you're not really prepared to do yeah. what it is that you're, you're actually about to do. I mean, I used to get upset about this exact issue when early in my career as a professor, they would have me come talk at what are called dissertation boot camps. It's like doctoral students, as they get closer to writing their PhDs, the, the grad school at various colleges will often have these boot camps. To teach you how to write your... Thesis. Yeah, and also to motivate each other. Like, we'll all get together, and they you write, like you have writing sessions, and then you have speakers come in. And so like when Georgetown learned about my older books, they're like, hey, you should come and talk. Yeah. And, and so I, I would talk to these boot camps. But I would get so frustrated because the, the, the only verb they would use for work on the dissertation was writing. 
Right. You got to get your writing hours in. How sure. many pages did you get in? How many words did you get in? And I would always come in and, and sort of give this righteous speech of like, well, writing is part of it, but what about the thinking? What do you have to say? Yeah. yeah. That, that, I mean, it's not just sitting down and writing. Sure. Don't make that the verb. If you really want to be a professional thinker, which is what these students were trying to do, you have to have a much more sophisticated relationship with thought. Yeah. You know? Now, I was a mathematician, essentially. So writing was really kind of the last step of that type of dissertation. Like by far the harder part was solving the proofs. Uh, the write up the proof was not. So I had this extreme vision of it that I was trying to generalize. But so we can't, the writing is expressing an idea. That idea has to be interesting and right. And how you form that idea, some of it happens on the page, but you also have to think. I think very little of it happens on the page. I think I think it's, this is a much more generalizable thing than maybe you're giving yourself credit for because people are it's like look you don't just start building a house like yeah. you have plans for the house first you know where yeah. everything goes and you know all the materials that you need first you don't just start like sawing boards and hammering stuff and just pouring cement yeah. yeah here's because... my here's my shitty first draft of my house <laughs> yeah, all right now not... i'm just going to like fix right. the walls yeah you, you have to you have to crack the whole thing and that's not to say you know like like look you design the house and then maybe later you're like, actually, hey, we got to move the refrigerator over here because like these doors are hitting each other. So yeah. like there are going to be specific uh, granular problems that you can really only wrap your head around once you're in the middle of doing those things. Like uh, like it's a you know, that's a that's a much later in the process problem. We'll yeah. cross that bridge when we come to it. But if you don't have a sense of the whole and you don't have a sense of how the large pieces like nobody does a puzzle. Like I, I, there's this funny uh, scene I remember in that show New Girl, yeah. where this guy loves doing puzzles, and he's like, "I think I figured out what it's gonna be." Like he 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 <laughs> without the box. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He was like, "Wait, you don't look at the box first? He's like, "You you're just no like the, you're making this." Yeah. You know, and and like obviously that might be a more intellectually challenging way to do a puzzle, but it's also insane. Yeah. You know, like like if you sit down to write a book or start a company or um, and and you don't know what it is that you're doing. You're just like, how can you know what the next right thing is? You know who I think ruined ruined this for people? It's novelists. Okay. Because some, a lot of novelists do this, yes. right? So it's the one type of writing. And in fact, I'm surprised the extent to which novelists do this. A lot of novelists excavate the story. Yeah. As they write. So Stephen King famously does this, right? He talks about that in On Writing. Uh, but a lot of literary novelists do it as well. They don't plan it out. Um, I was talking to a thriller writer who writes mysteries, right? You would think a mystery writer needs to understand in advance, yeah. like this is the twist. Yeah. That, no, she just rocks and rolls. She's like, I figure it out. Yeah. I figure it out as I go along, right? So I think this has pervaded culture. So anything that's adjacent to writing, mm -hmm. we're thinking about Stephen King on writing. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm just going to... We think of a musician the writing the song in seven minutes, but we're not thinking of like Taylor Swift who who yeah. thinks not just in terms of this album and the next album, but how these Easter eggs and this song connected. Yeah. Like the, the best stuff is for the most part, not stream of consciousness. Yeah. And the fantasy of is of course that it is, but it's almost never that way. And even the novelists, I would, I bet you could have sat down and had conversations with them and they would have told you more or less where they thought it was going. They, in, yeah, because they've done it enough that they're yeah. probably just internalizing outlining. Yes. But like inside their head, like, yeah, I know what the third act beat's going to be. Yeah. And, oh, this guy, okay, let me set him up now because I want to twist him to be the or, MacGuffin. Or maybe once you have developed characters yeah. who have a logic or uh, a set of values, you have effectively outlined the project because it is clear what they would do in a situation, right? And yeah. you can talk to you talk to novelists or TV writers or whatever, and they're like, "Well, they would never do this." Yeah. Like, uh, or Jim would never do this to Pam. Or, of course, you know, uh, the the season the, the show is going to end with this relationship or this action, right? Yeah. Um, uh, Kendall was never going to be the CEO, right? Like, you know, this they they know the stuff because they have developed the 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 ethos of the people yep. and and then that's deterministic but well, this is lee child right he knows what jack reacher because they someone wrote a book about how lee child writes his books i don't oh, know if really? you've seen this no. book before no, yeah it, it's really fantastic he spent a year following lee child while he wrote a jack reacher novel and yeah. then wrote a book about it it's all really huh. interesting uh 
but he knows Jack Reacher so well. Yes. That, yes, he doesn't have to. He has to come up with a, a setup. A plot. Yeah. yeah. And then every time a scenario happens, like, I know exactly what Jack Reacher is going to do here. Yes. You know, like, he's not going to get beat up. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. He's not going to be a, a wuss. He's going to probably crack some skulls. And, you know, we know what right. he cares about, what he doesn't. You know, but I, I think uh, something that was an advantage for me that I then tried to convey when other people are thinking about creative processes. So going back to the idiosyncratic field in which I came up in. So coming up in a theoretical computer scientist, you know, before I became a known writer, mainly I was doing applied mathematics. The core of that is proofs. And there's this feeling that our brain is wired for when the pieces click together. Yes. So you get very familiar with this feeling of the pieces have clicked together. Oh, that works. Even if you haven't worked out all the steps, yeah. it's like, boom, right? Mm -hmm. That exact same feeling is how I approach writing, right? It's the same thing when I'm walking and thinking like, how is this chapter going to work? Oh, I see. If I move this here and bring this thing here and I pull this out, it clicks. And it yeah. feels the same as when when a, a proof clicks. Nothing about that process involves hands on a keyboard. Uh, right. But it's something I think that's foreign sometimes when people are new to writing. It's it's this sense of you, you're, you are planning and going for a sensation of rightness before you even are looking at a sheet of paper. You're thinking about this will follow this. Does this idea make sense? Is this a bit of a MacGuffin? Yeah. Is there a red herring here? Like all these movie terms show up in nonfiction writing, yeah. as you know, right? I mean, why am I introducing this concept if it contradicts what comes later and there's no resolution of why it does? Like that's going to sit in just going to be grit in the gears of someone who's yeah. reading. And so when all that clicks in your head, then you know, okay, now I'm ready to Well, I've been write. thinking about this because I've been doing, this is the first time I've ever done interrelated books. So right. like... Most authors, uh, especially nonfiction, you're doing on independent, self-contained projects. You're like, I'm doing a book about this. I'm yeah. doing a book. About this. And perhaps you might sell one or two books at the same time or two books at the same time. But they're usually two unrelated books. Yeah. Right. I just had two ideas at the same time. They wanted to buy them. But to sell this series on the Cardinal Virtues was weird because first I've had to, I had to go, OK, the next four projects I'm doing are outlined. Yep. The order I'm doing them is outlined. And then. I had to think on the first one, you know, okay, how do I crack this book on courage? Who are the, the first, the, the first thing was what are the three parts and then who are the main characters in those three parts? Cause that's the structure I was doing. But then I had to go, okay, does this thing that I think is an important trait of a, you know, a, a virtuous person, is this actually in courage or is this actually in justice? Is this a self-discipline thing or is this more rooted in wisdom? And so, it, because if I make a decision in book one, it has implications yeah. for uh, book two, three, and four. And that's something I'm, I've decided, I came up with it maybe in the discipline book, but I decided to move it to the wisdom book, which was a form of wisdom and talent. And I think it fits into this idea of, of like truly being productive is like an awareness of downstream consequences or how moving this thing yeah. changes these other things. Um, and people who don't, who are too rushed or frenzied or they haven't stepped back and gotten a, a larger perspective are not able to do that. So so like you could be talking to an employee and go, ah, sorry, uh, Tuesday's thing isn't gonna, the email or that, that thing isn't gonna work. And you take it for granted that because you've touched this thing, yeah. all these other things now have to change, but they're, they just do this thing. It's like, Hey, yeah. if I like, Hey, you're doing my calendar. And then I, I just told you like, actually I have to get on a plane on Thursday. You have to cancel everything that was in the yeah. calendar on Friday. Right. And that, that requires an ability to see how things are interrelated and you have to have a sense of the whole, what you're trying to accomplish to know what they're related to and leading up to. Yes. So now we're getting really far away from let's just rock and roll yeah, and yeah. start. Just, what are you doing right now? You know, it's, this is a bit of a divergence, but I've been working on this article for The New Yorker, an artificial intelligence yeah. article. But this exact distinction comes up, and maybe this will be out by the time this interview airs, but it's an exact uh, distinction between what large language models, like the GPT models that power chat GPT, uh, what they can and can't do. The number one thing they can't do, if you're looking at it from an actual engineering perspective, is look into the future huh. and understand, mm. simulate possibles, uh, possibilities yeah. in the future, right? So it can only look at what you have right now, yeah. knowing what it knows, spit out some good words that matches this. And so the future of AI are these systems where you have a language model and then you have these simulators 
huh. right? And the technology comes out of game bots, right? This is how you win at chess. It's how you win at Go. It's how you win at checkers with a computer. You have to look into the future. Yeah. Well, if we do this, what might they do? What might yeah. this do? Uh, and so generalizing that is what's needed for AI to look anything like we might actually think of as a human intelligence, right? So like in 2001, HAL, right, the supercomputer, uh, won't open the pod bay doors, right? So the Dave is like, open the pod bay doors, and Hal knows, like, this. You're, you you want to disconnect me. Yeah. No, how does he know that? Well, he has to be able to See simulate, yeah. well, if I do this, and you're going to do this, and this yeah. is something I don't want you to do. So actually, uh, the, the kind of the takeaway here is simulating the future uh, in the article is core to how humans think. Yes. And it's like one of the reasons why there's a big gap between, you know, chat GPT and a human is seeing the implications of things in the future. A bit of a divergence, but it's it's no, interesting no. though. I mean, you think like game theory would be this thing that like Aristotle was talking about, yeah. but it's like really recent. It's von Neumann, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I talk about, I tell the story of the Cuban Missile Crisis and so this is the key, which I think is another example of, of this idea of stepping back and seeing the big picture. Like the the military advice to Kennedy is unanimous like bomb cuba and like you cannot wait one more second until you yeah. do this like the future of humanity depends on you basically wiping cuba from the map yeah and only kennedy <coughs> who's not trained in you know uh these things goes but what will the russians do yeah you know and and the ability to just think like well i'm gonna do this and then what they are gonna he's thinking what are the people in the room with khrushchev telling him yep right and obviously they gave him bad advice because the idea that the United States is just going to allow there to be uh, missiles on Cuba was like ridiculous on its face. But but Kennedy realizes like he has the same hardline advisors that I do. Yeah. And he steps back and, and to his credit, like we call this the 13 days, like it could have happened in 13 minutes. You yeah. know what I mean? Like he, he says we need time to think about this and they both finally do. But but he's he's. He has both the empathy, the self-control, the wisdom, also the sense of like, hey, if we screw this up, we're all going to die yeah. to go like, yeah, my best option is this. Yes. But your only option after I use my best option is the worst option. Yes. And we're not going to walk away from that. Well, I'm going to complete the circle then because uh, so part of what Kennedy coincidentally compared to the last story, part of what he was doing in this time is in the Kennedy White House. They were a big fan of this new board game called Diplomacy, huh? Right, which was it's a board game. I don't know if you know it, but it's sort of like Risk. It's a World War One Europe, but the key to Diplomacy is before every move, all the players talk privately with each other, right? So you have these one-on-one -on -one private conversations. You're making deals and alliances. You're backstabbing. It's all relationships. Yeah. And then after you talk to everybody, everyone writes down their move and gives it to an arbiter who then does all the moves. And you see, hey, was I betrayed or this or that? So yeah. uh, Kennedy was really into this game. Supposedly Kissinger, the lore is, like would train by playing this game to get ready for like his real politic role as Secretary of State. You know, it's funny. You can see these notepads from Kennedy yeah. during the missile crisis. And I'm just thinking of this as you say it right now. What He writes diplomacy, 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 diplomacy. Like he's just writing They've it down. He's been playing this game. Yeah, so he's probably, that's probably what he's thinking so, about. So, but here's what's interesting about it. So in, the, in this article I was working on, the what was interesting, what it's about is, uh, so a group of engineers at Meta created an AI that wins at diplomacy. Okay. Right? So yeah. they, they're they using web diplomacy server. People don't know they're sure. playing against, a, yeah. they don't know they're playing against a computer. Uh, and how did that work is that the only way this could work, and I talked to some of the engineers at Meta, is they, they at first tried to just train up a language model, like a GPT-4, to just know a lot about diplomacy. Yeah. And like, this is a good move based yeah. on other moves I've seen in the past. And they sure. said it's, it's terrible, right? But when they added in a future simulator, right? Because the, uh, the, the main engineer on this had, had come up uh, winning at poker. He built the first bot that actually beat professional poker players, okay. right? So he knew, and that's sure. all simulating moves in the future. They put these two things yeah. together. That's how they began to win at diplomacy with AI. Interesting. Is that they had the language model that could say, here's what the other players just said, and here's what right. I think this means, and then a simulator model that was figuring out. So if this happens, what would they do? And if, well, if they're lying though, what would happen? And it would work through the possibilities. You put these two things together, now you can you can play diplomacy well. So yeah, so it all connects. Yeah, I was just, I'm writing this story in the book I'm doing now and there's sort of a controversial figure in it, but I really want to include the story. Yeah. And so like, I think earlier on in my life, like let's say when I was obstacle, I'd just be like, I like the story, I'm including it. Yeah. And now, 
knowing that, okay, then you get asked about it or then it doesn't age well or whatever. I'm like, okay, what is the footnote that I have to put here to anticipate yes. the objection and address it? And you have a good one. I forget who you're talking about. Les um, Moonves, maybe? Yeah. Yes. No, Les Mo- no, there's someone else. That was else. one we thought about, yeah. There's someone else you mentioned um, who wasn't good. I forget who it was, but it was interesting. You were like, uh, oh, um, Someone who who uh, marries their Mitch, uh, Ian Fleming. Oh, Ian Fleming. Yeah, yeah you're like, hey, yeah. like I'm only using him in this regard. Yeah, I are I do know about the other stuff. Not a great just, husband. Yeah, I not know a about great the other husband. stuff. Yeah. I'm just choosing not to mention. This is not mes- necessary for the story. Yeah, but like, that's to me, that's a good example of uh, aware of downstream consequences. Like you're like, I've done this enough times. Yep. I know if I do this, a potential reader objection is is why. Yes. So. If I do this in the interim, I can preempt that and then we can just move on. Yes. Which is, by the way, all nonfiction writing now yeah. is like because there's a whole segment. There's a whole segment of review strategy, which is if, if I have an objection, my review is sophisticated. Yeah. So it's like a lot, a lot of what we do these days is having to play defense against that. But that's insider baseball. No, no, no. Of course. Well, OK, so I want to talk about something that I thought about in the book because you tell the story of Merlin Mann and he has this sort of breakdown in box zero. Yeah. I am curious because I I've I've read that story. I hear people they're like, oh, I was burned out, you know, I was doomed to it. But then I actually like look at what they did, and how busy they were, and I don't get it. And then I also look at their output and productivity after, and it doesn't look that much better either. Do you yeah. know what I mean? I feel like there's there's almost this like this like competition to like claim you had this like breakdown and then you had this breakthrough and on either side i just go like show me the work do you know what i mean right like right. what have you done well you're, you're saying someone will have like a breakdown like i'm burnt out yeah and then be super hustling on the other side about no, the story no, no, no. of uh of slowing down or something like yeah, this. yeah yeah or, or just like like i just i i guess it's i guess what i'm saying is when you look at the productivity space as a whole yeah the people who are writing about either like you got to hustle you got to work 40 hours a week you know or sorry 40 hours a day blah blah blah. i'm like show me what you do like show me show me the like show me the actual success because i don't see it and then on the other hand i I see the the people who are like i i was doing that but now i'm doing this better thing and i'm much more balanced and i go also show me the fucking work yeah and i like to me the people i admire aren't talking about productivity that much yeah and they're just like the the proof is in the pudding do you know what i mean and i think yeah. you're a good example you've you've written all these books you're talking about it of course but my, my point is like to me the the ultimate validator of any strategy is like what's the outcome yeah you know and there is this whole sort of guru space and I just don't see it. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like the the marketing people who have never sold anything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the productivity space is, I mean, I'm interested in your take on it. It's a weird space, right? And uh, if we look just in books, for example, um, it's often claimed, like you mentioned there, like, oh, there's all these people out there saying work 80 hours yeah. a day or whatever. Actually, they're not. Like <laughs> no one writes books. Yeah. The last book I could find, maybe you know some others. I, I've looked into this. Like, okay, every every article about productivity starts with, I know everyone else is telling you <laughs> yeah. to work all the time, but yeah. guess what? Shocker. I'm saying work. No one is actually saying that. Like yeah. the, the only book I could find along those lines was maybe Extreme Productivity which was this book that came out about 10 years ago, where it was just like a, actually, I thought it was a, a good concept book. It's a busy executive. And he just says, I'm very busy. Here's how I do it. Uh, I think the hustle porn. It's more thing, online, I think. It's definitely online. Yeah. yeah, you're right. It's not in books. But but there is, it's like when when you see it, like, here's my schedule. And the schedule's insane. Yeah. You know what I mean? An, it's an online thing. Yeah. Yeah. There, and there is a whole sort of more youth-oriented Instagram, YouTube, TikTok culture. Yeah. Uh, and I've learned more about that. And some of that has gone to weird extremes, right? Like I used to write about how to study yeah. when I was in my early 20s. There's a whole study YouTube space, which is now someone will live stream 12 consecutive hours of studying. <laughs> yeah. It's performance art, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's not at this point actually. I've never done anything for 12 12- 
hours and consecutively in my life it's ever sleep it's crazy you know? and then yeah. people yeah the, the people laud it right so yeah. so I, I agree that's true um the nice thing about productivity as a space though is that you can just study people who aren't writing about it yes right yes. You, right you yeah, can yeah, actually just I mean. say right like yeah. what which is which is what i do heavily yeah heavily in the book and, and it's why like in the, like a big portion of this book for example is also trying to uh, understand because it's looking more at knowledge work understand what we even mean by productivity now because it's broken Right. Yeah. Like trying to understand how did we what do we actually mean by productivity? We don't really know. And if we really nail it down, it's not really working well. So what would it look like to do something different? There's, there's a whole cultural critique aspect. But even that is getting tricky because I think in response to the the, the same cause, right, this this growing burnout among knowledge workers, uh, there's also been a huge rise in what I think of as the anti productivity movement, which uh is also heavily critical, but in a way that I think is less like the ironically work movement. It's or, like an yeah. anti-work movement yeah. as a response to the burnout, right? right. Um, and so it's a, ironically it's out of a non-productive critique yeah, yeah. of productivity. Well, workaholism and work aversion are two sides of the same coin. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and it's um, culturally salient, right? So there's a there's a certain theoretical sophistication if you can maybe bring in like late stage capitalism or some other yeah. types of like grad seminar style critique. Um, but ultimately those critiques end up being pretty nihilistic, right? Yeah. It's like, don't work. Yeah. Uh, except is, for like is, sub subscribe to my sub stack like, that I'm working very hard on, but otherwise <laughs> don't work. <laughs> well, like I, I like those two books, the, the daily routines books, uh, yeah. or daily rituals books. Uh, they're both very good. There's the one for men and yeah, then Mason one of women's Curry. return. Yeah. But it's like, this dude, that's the only thing, those are the only two things he's done. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? And I always go just, that's, I I know what it takes to do a book, like two books in 10 or 15 years or whatever is like not enough. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like they're not like works of staggering original genius, yeah. you know? Like, so I'm like, what are you doing all day? And so sometimes I, I, I hear about these productivity experts or these people who are like, this tip, the, whatever. And I go like, but what are you doing? Yeah. And I look at it and I'm, I'm, I just don't, I don't get it. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that maybe they look at me or, or you or something and they assume we're, we're working crazy hours, but it's like, I'm not at all. Yeah. And so I don't. I don't get, I just don't, I'm just like, I guess I come back to this question. I'm like, what are these people doing all day? Well, I mean, I think it's why, uh, it helps me for sure when I write about these topics, the fact that I'm a, I'm a professor. Yeah. Um, the bulk of my writing, you know, I write for The New Yorker where I'm yeah. on the contributing staff and most of it's really more about techno critique. Like yeah. I'm, I'm a, I run the, or help found the Center for Digital Ethics at Georgetown. I do a lot of thinking about technology and the way yeah. it interacts with us and our lives and do a lot of writing on it. Uh, and that's all stuff that's not just writing about productivity. Yeah, yeah sure. And then I think it helps. I'm like, okay, uh, hey, by the way, I don't work big hours. So like, how is this possible? Let's let's rethink about productivity. Hopefully that lands more yeah. as opposed to, you know, what I do is just YouTube videos about productivity, right? I mean, yeah, there's a, yeah, uh, yeah, I think it, it does help. Yeah, there's just, there's something, I don't know. It, it, I've, I've said this before, but it's like, I feel like, am, I said, uh, amateurs obsess about tools. Yeah. And like pros just sort of do the thing. And yeah. usually their system isn't this sort of perfect, sexy, like systemic thing. That's what I, I like in your book. It's like, yeah, it just takes a lot of walks or she yeah. sits there a lot or actually she had this breakthrough on a, on a vacation in the woods, you know, it, it's, yeah. it's, it's never as complicated as the people trying to market some solution or new paradigm for thinking about it. Want you to think it no, is. they keep shipping. Right. Yeah. Uh, and they don't procrastinate. Yeah. Like it's kind of like, okay, I want to, I want to keep shipping something. But it's not just putting something out the door. It's like, I really am trying to make this really good. Yeah. Like, I care a lot about making this good. I'm trying to grow. I'm trying to improve my skills. But also, I'm going to get it out the door, and then we move yeah. on to what's next. And I, I think you probably do the same thing. But it's always been my strategy with books is that, well, the next one is going to be a great strategy. I just tell myself yes. while I'm writing, uh -huh. all right, I want to do this as well as possible. But don't worry about, like, this has to be everything the next book is going to be the one and and then you just ship what you're doing right you're like i'll do yeah. this one well but yeah then the next one is gonna is gonna win the national book award right you you it, it allows you to it takes the pressure off it's so like okay this just needs to be good yes and you try to do something good and you ship it yeah there's some humility but then also freedom and understanding that quantity is a way to get to quality yeah right so if you're someone who sits down you're a musician and you're like i have to write the greatest song of all time yeah uh, you're probably not going to do it because yep. you're not going to write enough songs, right? Yes. Like, um, 
oftentimes the, the, the hit that defines a band or a movement, or you're like, this is my favorite in the catalog. It's different. It's unexpected. It was dashed off in a few minutes as part of a larger project. Yeah. Right. And so the, the idea that you, it, it's weird. You obsess about quality. Yes. But then also you do it enough that you're not precious about any one yep. thing. And so that balance to very easily, I think Churchill said like uh, you could spell uh, perfectionism as paralysis. Yeah. And, and so if you're trying to make something amazing, this work of staggering world altering genius, you're not going to do it. But if you're just consistently making stuff, you're going to be getting better and better. And you're also going to be getting more and more opportunities. Um, some of them very timely and some of them very timeless to express that talent or excellence you've developed. And you're going to increase the chances that one of those is going to be great. Yeah. I mean, my, my best selling book was my fifth. My Which first book, uh, Deep Work. Okay. My first book to hit the New York Times bestseller list was my sixth. Yes. You know, this is basically my trajectory also. Yeah. Yes. It gets rolling. Yeah. But I think you and I had the advantage, if, if we're going to think just about writers, is also we started young. Uh huh. Right. Sure. It's just like, let's just get started. And, yeah. you know, I got started really young, right? I mean, I, I, I signed my first deal right after my 21st birthday. Okay. And there's very few books they're going to let you know, a 21 year old, right. But that was very freeing. Mm -hmm. It was like, okay, uh, my pitch was, let me write about college advice because I'm a college student. And there's an angle there that kind of made sense mm -hmm. for turning the keys over to 21 year old, but that took the pressure off. It's like, yeah, this, this is practical. I'm just trying to write a book that works. It's for a very narrow audience. And let me write, and I wrote another one right away. Yeah. Right? Like, let me just write another one like mm -hmm. that. Let me try to make that a little bit better. There's less pressure than if I had waited until, you know, I was in my thirties and established as a professor and said, here's my first book. And this is better be really smart and get a good review in the New York times book review. And what if people think I'm stupid yeah. by the time I was a professor, I'd already published four books, right? You right, know, right, it was right. a, sure. it was a different, I was like, I've been out there, uh, you know, I've been taking swings. So it, th to be able to just get started when the pressure is lower. I think Michael Lewis is best, his best book. And then I think his best selling book is the big short, right? <coughs> and, He's like 20 plus, 25 years into yeah. doing it when that comes out. And, and and he's been writing about finance. He's been writing about characters. He's been writing about the economy. He's been writing about people, unique stories for all this time. He, <clears throat> he wrote a lot of forgettable books between yeah. those two. And he's written some forgettable ones since, right? Yeah. Um, but the man met the moment and <clears throat> that man had thousands of hours and thousands of pages of experience yes and so that book probably did come together pretty easily and he couldn't have known like just where the great recession was going to go just what it would mean that it would eventually be he couldn't have known any of that yep. but he was uniquely suited to do that thing because uh he'd done all these other things and lewis got started the exact same way you and i did right so my first book why are they going to give me a deal? Okay, to write about students. Your yeah. first book, it was writing about your specific yeah. professional experience you had gone through. Trust me, I'm lying. Yeah. Lewis's first book about his experience at Solomon yeah. Brothers. Yeah, yeah. right. Sure. So it was like, get in the door however you can, right? And, yeah. and so he did that, and then that got him Vandy Fair. He yes. was doing election coverage. People forget this, but yeah. like he was making his bones on character writing, mm -hmm. uh, doing, he was covering like primary elections for Vandy Fair, which had, yeah. which had great editors, and it, that yep. was helping him hone his craft, right? Sure. And then he wrote The New New Thing. Yes, which, also great. Yeah, but like people don't remember that book. No, people no, don't remember who about, Jim Clark is. Yeah, it's and about Netscape. Hyperion, right. you know. No, he and, wrote a book called... Um, what is it? He, he wrote a book that came out like on September 11th, like about uh, the about the tech boom. Yes. That, then the bubble popped and it was immediately forgotten. Yeah. Um, yeah. He wrote a bunch of and, and he was writing for Slate and the New Republic. He was just like a magazine yeah. writer. Yeah. And always be working on a project. What's my next book? You know, uh, and I bet he had that same mentality we talked about. I want this book to be good. Yes. But, you know, the next one, that'll be the, the yeah. big short. Right. So you ship. Yes. You know, you uh -huh. try to be good, but you ship. But I, we can generalize this, though, right? I mean, I think this is a lot of interesting production, even in a normal job, right? Like, even in a normal job with a desk that you have to go to, yeah. there probably is, this is what really matters that I could do. Like, this is the skill, the type of project I work on. This is what moves the needle, not the email, not the meetings, but the white papers I write or whatever, right? So even there, these same type of mindsets apply of, like, I'm going to do really well. I'm going to produce great stuff here. I'm going to keep pushing myself to get better, but I'm not going to get too precious with it. And if I just start that, I'm Michael Lewis writing books two for six, 
uh, I'm going to end up at some point with at this new level of skill. I'm going to be indispensable, right? So this sort of slowly productive approach, I think, generalizes pretty far. That's a really important skill. Like, what is the stuff that matters and what is the stuff that doesn't matter? Like, yeah. how, how do you know what actually is important? Because a job has a whole bunch of responsibilities. Uh, there is certain obligations that do matter, certain ones that don't. There's certain traditions or best practices that are important and other ones are just sort of ritual or, you know, uh, uh, inertia or the status quo. And so knowing, yeah, hey, these are the, like, like one of the rules I have as a writer and set, like people go, how many uh, you know pages a day do you write or how many words a day do you write? I, I think those are totally nonsense metrics because first off, uh, all books are of different lengths, yep. right? So if I'm a novelist, I have to turn in a hundred or 200,000 word book, right? Even that's a huge difference, right? Yeah. Like there's short novels and long novels. Like the, but every book contract has a different length, word count that you have to deliver. And mine's like between 50 and 60,000 words, which is a very short book, right? Yeah. So if I'm someone who writes 4,000 words a day, like some novelists do, like it's not gonna take me very long to write yeah. these books. Um, so, so word count doesn't really make sense. Pages don't really count because are you counting like in yeah, Google Docs what, what or page, Word or yeah, you know that's note, nonsense. Yeah. I and, and so I just I just say I have to make a positive contribution every day. Like I have to do something that moves the manuscript forward in some way. So that could be I generated a bunch of new pages. That also could be. I figured out the subtitle, yeah. you know, that could be, I deleted a bunch of pages. Yeah. I moved things around. I found two chapters actually are about the same thing and I decided to combine them. And so all I have to do is make a positive contribution every day. And so I have a vague sense of what is a positive contribution and then what's just like fiddling, but like knowing if you're a stock trader, yeah. you know, or, or uh, in a, if you run a, a hedge fund or you're a venture capitalist or I don't know, you coach a football team. What is like, and you're saying, okay, what's my positive contribution today? Yeah. Do you actually know what that is? It's really because hard. It's, it's probably not that I was here from this time to this time. It's probably not measured by I was in this many meetings or I yelled at this many people. It's got to be like, oh, no, no, no. I figured out that on, uh, I figured out that Jordan, uh, was it Kobe or someone? They were like, I figured out Kobe goes to his left, but when he goes to his right, he shoots, you know, 11% worse from the field. Yeah. And so all I have to do it. So that itself is a huge breakthrough. And then the next day, I'm just going to figure out how am I going to make this person go to their right yeah. instead of the left. Yeah. What do I do with that, my footwork? Yeah. That, that's, the, that's yep. what matters. Not how many weights did you lift, but what's the things that matter that move the needle and to be able to figure that out. That's yes. almost everything. That is. So I think it is almost everything. And, and I think it is hard. Harder than we think and also undervalued, yes. right? Like it really is everything, but here's what happens. Uh, people don't even try to find it, right? Because what people do instead is they write the story of what they want to be true. Okay. Like, I think this is the, the, the biggest obstacle to people moving really far forward on something they care about. They write a story for themselves about this is what I want to be true about what it takes to move to the next level because this is what I actually want to do. Okay. Right. So I want it to be about, okay, to be, get my novel published. It's about like having the right Scrivener set up and, and a national novel writing month or doing this many words a day or whatever. Sit at this typewriter. I get to sit at this typewriter. Yeah. Or, yeah. Because that's kind of fun. It's like usually the stories people come up with right. is a, a challenging, but tractable. Yes. Yeah. Like it's, it's gonna be a little bit hard, but I could do it. I can feel good about myself. And we do this all the time. It's about this or it's about that. Right. Um, I think internet culture has also really, especially for younger people, uh, inculcated this idea of the like the shortcut. Yeah. Like, yeah. If you you, know, you got the you the got hack. the right advice yeah. here, and you're going to really make your way yeah. through. And I keep learning again and again in my career. Like the number one thing you can do is figure out how do people actually succeed at this. Yeah. And like you have to stare that in the face, right? It's often very narrow. Like the path is very narrow, yeah. not really open to reinvention. Uh -huh. It's like no, this is if you want to play you're a good chess player. You want to play chess at the master level. This is what the training looks like. Yeah. Right. There's no like way you're going to get around. You want to be a professional musician. Yeah. Like this is what it looks like. And it still might not succeed. Uh, you want like your podcast to be successful, right? It's probably, no, this is what you have to do. And you know, that's really hard. Right. And sometimes when you face the reality, you say, you find out I can't do that. Right. Yeah. Or sure. I don't have what it, takes. I don't have what it takes or I do, but I, I don't have the, the willingness uh, to, to put in that much time. You know, I can't do that. All yeah. right. Uh, 
but that's good because you say, great, then let me not try to do that and let me find something else. Um, so we don't try to do that work. And it's really hard work. I mean, one of the things I've recommended people do in like a normal job where you're doing this is temporarily make yourself a business journalist. I am going to like take people out for coffee who uh, they're where I want to be. Yeah. Right. I don't know yet how they got there, but that's my model. Like I like what they're doing. If I could get there, their flexibility, this would, this was where I want to be. All right. Let me now, as if I'm writing a Michael Lewis book about this person, like really interview them. Uh, don't ask them. This is a journalist trick. You never ask people, what's your advice for doing this? Yes. People are terrible at giving advice, right? I mean, trust me, I've been down to yeah. someone who writes and interviews yeah. people about advice. They're terrible at getting advice. It puts people on the spot. And what they do is frantically try to think of something that's internally consistent. Yeah. Like that's what happens if I say, give me your advice for like succeeding in a bookstore. Like if I put yeah. you on the spot here, yeah. you would come up with something yeah, yeah. because like I want to have an answer that makes sense, but like it could have nothing to do with what matters. So don't ask them for their advice. Ask them, well, what happened in your first year? Yeah. When was the next promotion? Oh, interesting. What did you do if you think about it? What were you doing there that the other people who were sort of up for this and didn't get it? What were you doing that they weren't? Oh, so I'm right. isolating. Like that's what mattered. Okay, what were you doing that didn't really matter if you rewound that? When you have these conversations, it pulls out like, oh, this is what matters. And there's usually a moment of, oh, shoot, this is what really matters, right? Yeah. But that can also be followed by some inspiration. You're like, okay, okay, this is much harder than I thought it was going to be, but at least I see the path that actually goes uphill to the top of the the top of the hill. I think Tim Ferriss told me one time, he was like, one of the secrets when he's trying to figure something out or learn something that, that's really hard is he, he's like, I don't want to talk to like the best person in the world or even like the second best person in the world. I want to talk to someone who's really good at it, but shouldn't be good at it. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So if you ask Michael Jordan or Shaquille O'Neal how they got good at basketball, they're yeah. going to tell you this whole, you know, Michael Jordan's like, oh, it's like, he, he makes up this story about getting cut from the high school basketball team, which didn't happen. That's not how it was yeah. at all. But if you ask Bugsy Bugs or yeah, Spud Webb. I was thinking Webb, John Stockton. Right, like about, so, yeah. someone who, who on paper shouldn't be as good as yeah. they were. That Alan person's Iverson, clearly yeah. figured something out. Yeah. Uh, and and maybe, and they've probably had to think about it more. Actually, this is an argument in Michael Lewis's uh, Moneyball. He's like, Billy Bean was just not good enough at baseball that he had to really figure out the game of baseball yeah. to to play it at all. Yeah. Robert Green is a good example of this. Is Robert Green was Henry Kissinger, he probably wouldn't be able to write the 48 Laws of Power. It's that he keeps getting bounced around and it's not working for him that he has to understand it and be able to articulate it in a way that someone who is intuitively or naturally good or in the room where it's happening, probably not gonna be able to explain it the same way. Yeah, I mean, this reminds me, I was just, before I came here, was on Santa Monica with Mark Manson. Yeah. And so, you know, he co-wrote the Will Smith. Yes. I don't know, so we're talking Will Smith, and I was, it was a great book. Um, and that's one of the things that comes out in that book. And Mark and I were talking about that. You know, Will Smith also is, like, very unlikely to be uh, the biggest movie star in the world yeah. when he's a, he's a TV star with a music background. Yeah, sure. Uh, but he studied Tom Cruise. Huh. Right. So part of why Will Smith was thinking, OK, what is Tom Cruise doing? Yeah. What's working? What's not? And he figured out a lot of things that wasn't obvious. Right. So he was studying Cruise because Cruise was older and was the biggest movie star in the world. And he figured out things, for example, like, oh, the international markets. I see huh. international box office right. generates 50 percent more money. It gives you more clout. And Cruise is going to every one of these countries. Uh. and doing these international publicity junkets that no one else is doing. Right. And so then Smith could say, okay, uh, we want to do exactly what Cruz is doing there, right? right and sure, now sure. suddenly... That, so that, you think The Tonight Show is why he is an international movie star, yeah. and it's actually some Dutch newspaper that he gave an hour to yeah. over and over and over again, you know, times every country in Europe. He's going to China. Asia, yeah. Exactly. Like Tom Cruise really sure. innovated, like, go to China, go to Japan. I mean, there's some, yeah. some of this was before the Chinese market yeah. opened it up, but actually go... To these sure. other countries so he was really studying and then of course this you can see this becoming almost pathological right. when you get to the point in that autobiography where will smith now is so intent on winning when he plays monopoly that he hires a professional monopoly coach to teach yeah. him how to always win at monopoly to the point where eventually jada was like what are you doing yeah, yeah we're yeah, playing sure. with like our kids uh but but that's the mindset right is like okay i want to be you know in that case the number one movie star in the world um, I can write a story, which is like have the 
right type of movie yeah. or like be in good shape. He's like, but why don't I get to the core right. of like what actually matters? No, that's interesting because it does come back to the idea of slow productivity, which is sometimes the thing that makes someone naturally productive, naturally good, is that sort of ambition, that drive, that sort of forward motion. And that can make you successful to a point. Yeah. But it's also very difficult to turn off. And and if you're trying to do your thing sustainably over a long period of time, if you don't want to burn out or blow yourself up or uh, succeed, but at the cost of marriage, family, happiness, health, etc., yeah. uh, to be able to do it slowly and a bit more meaningfully and maybe obsess over quality a bit more, that's a whole other set of skills that are, are they're not as celebrated. They're also, depending on your personality, personality type, not sort of as natural and they're not the other thing you notice is they're really separatable from busyness hmm. right so even the 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 super hard uh, driving hard charging driving ambitions like the will smiths of the world yeah. right uh they are working really really hard but they're also not busy in the sense of you know a normal person might be with i'm on an email here a call here a bunch yeah, of different things going sure, a lot sure, of sure. activity uh, another hollywood example would be director chris nolan right doesn't own a smartphone doesn't yeah. own a phone at all yeah. right he's a guy who works really hard right and it's so, not that he never does phone calls no and of he course ha- he does and he has yeah. people who have phones around him but yeah. it's not really about you know hey who's taking your calls it's the yeah. it's the signal that says which is I don't want to be part of the typical Hollywood chatter of like this representation yeah. calling about this yeah. and let's go have lunch. Let's, he's like, I just want to work on my movies. Yeah. Right. So sometimes slow productivity, some of these exemplars, they're working really, really hard, but it's focused and it's intentional. And there's typically huge variations in intensity. Yeah. So it's, you know, six months until Oppenheimer comes out and I'm in the editing room all day, but then like two years might go by after that when I'm just dating, you yeah. know, so it's, it's more balanced, but they're not busy. Yeah. Right. Which is that first principle in the book of doing fewer things. They're not covering their plates with lots of different things and lots of different options because no one ever got great doing that. Yeah. I've, I've, uh, and this ties to your email book, but I've the becoming the person who is not on top of their email was a skill I had to learn. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like to be, to, to, and it, it feels almost egotistical or a little like, uh, what's even the word like it, it feels like self-important or, or uh, dramatic to yeah. be like no i'm i'm the i'm the artistic type that that does it oh sorry i didn't see that or yeah. hey i'm responding to this three months after you send it to me but i was off doing this thing like i actually had to i had to sort of consciously do that yeah because first off it just became too much but also that skill which i learned at some point of like you hit it into my court. I'm hitting it back into your court. Like that's that's me getting good at a game that I, or that's me being good at a game that I don't really want to be playing. I want to be playing this game, yes. which is I got, I don't know what day it is. Yeah. Or like I lost yeah. track of this or sorry, you were talking to me. I wasn't paying attention. I you, I have to almost cultivate the, the yeah, again, this is somewhat of a stereotype of the artist or the professor or the finger person, but like, no, no, that's the game that I want to be playing. That's the world that I want to be living in. And and there's almost an affectation to it that is the opposite of what most people are doing or what you grew up doing or what you are comfortable doing. And so I'm just like, I just have to go, yeah, I, I have 400 unread emails, like real emails, not like thousands of newsletters, yeah. but just like there's a bunch of people, some of them very important. I'm not like, I'm not saying like, screw you. I'm not going to get back to you. I'm just saying like, even thinking about what I'm going to say and replying is taking me away from this thing, which is where I should be. Yeah. I mean, it's Chris Nolan without a phone. Yeah. Like I'm trying to make this movie. Yeah. You know, and this other stuff is cool, but I'm trying to make this movie or Neil yeah. Stevenson's why well, I'm a bad correspondent yeah. essay. Right. He's like, if I answered all these letters and went to all these conferences, which is what science fiction writers typically do uh, in the end, I would have all these different one-on-one conversations to point at, but yeah. I'd rather have, like a hundred thousand word book yes. that a million people read, yes. you know, that's better than uh-huh. having 500, making 500 people yeah, happy in a conversation. But the same, that same mindset is applicable even to jobs where, okay, I have a boss and I can't completely just stop listening to emails. And yeah. so people will often say, uh, so, you know, it must be nice for you, but I don't yeah. even want to hear this advice because yeah, like, sure. I can't just be Neil Stevenson or Chris yeah. Nolan, but knowing the game that matters 
really makes a difference. Now you might not be able to play it as purely sure. as a full-time writer, yeah. but you can for sure play that game better than the other people in your office if they don't even know that's the game they're playing. So you're not able to ignore your inbox, but when you understand like, oh, this is what's going to make a difference in my company. Now there's all sorts of things you can do to reduce the burden of that inbox to begin to uh, trade, you know, Adam Grant calls yeah. them idiosyncrasy credits. Yes. Uh, as I get better at this, I'm going to trade accountability, hold me accountable yeah. for less accessibility. I'm not involved in these things over here. There's things you can start doing if you know the game you're supposed to be playing and it's going to be maybe very uh, specifically constructed for your particular job and the personalities. Uh, but it shouldn't be, we shouldn't let imperfect be the obstacle of being much better. So even in a job where I'm, I, I can't throw out my email address, if I know this is what's going to make the difference and this is getting in the way, there's a lot I can do where I'm now spending two more, two X yeah. more time on this than I was before. I still have to do emails, but I'm doing half as many because now I'm starting to, I, I'm getting clear about what I'm trying to do here. Yeah, for better or for worse, businesses will make all sorts of allowances for people who get stuff done and deliver results. Yes. Do you know what I mean? And look, if you're at a company where you're delivering crazy good results, you know what's you know, you're you're like a top or an elite performer and they're hassling you about your dress code, you're probably at the wrong company and yep. there is a company that will not hassle you about that and like make whatever arrangements or stipulations you want yeah. to uh, to get you. Like talent is the rare, it is always the variable that is rarest. It's the number one problem employers have yes. is getting good people. Yeah. They're desperate for good people. I think sometimes we tell the story in our heads of like, no, it's just this like purely sort of vindictive exploitative yeah. relationship. And, yeah. and like, I'm nobody and they're just sort of pulling the strings. What can I do? People are desperate for good people. Yeah. You know, I gave you, I gave you credit for this in an interview recently. I don't oh. know if I actually heard this from okay. you or not. So you'll have okay. to tell yeah, me yeah. if this was you or not. Uh, there's a danger along these lines. There's a danger, especially when you're in a, it's the opposite danger. It's like when you're new to a position, being too good at the stuff that's not the core value. Uh -huh. And I don't know if this is from when you were talking about early on being an assistant. Yeah, I was career. an assistant in, in Hollywood. And, and this guy who's now a very big movie producer, uh, he, he was like, he was like, look, I was where you were. He's like, my best advice to you is like, don't be too good of an assistant. He was yeah. pointed down the hall. He's like that guy right there. They'll never let you go. He, he's like, he's a lifer. Yeah. And he's like, uh, there's two types. There's people who are lifers and then there are people who are going places and you got to decide which one you want to be. He's always been saying like, if you want to be an assistant, if you want to be an assistant, don't, uh, don't be, be one. But he was saying, yeah, like if you are indispensable on the phones, yeah, they'll keep you on the phones. But if you're holding down the phones, but you keep like giving your boss good ideas that they use in meetings, like they'll promote you much quicker. Right. So be competent. Don't be incompetent. Yeah. So be like, clearly I'm competent. Like I'm not dropping the ball and I can kind of do these things, but I'm not going out of my way to be like, hey, I foresaw that like yeah. this is near your dry cleaner <laughs> and I set up the driver to stop. Like don't yeah, make yeah, their yeah. life too easy, yeah. um, but then keep signaling. Yeah. The stuff that matters for the next rung up, which is take me off the phone to make me a junior agent, yes. that I'm showing you I could bring in money. Yes. Yeah, like I, I probably have what it takes to do that, right? I'm not easily flustered. I have good ideas. I'm good with the client relations. Uh, I'm okay with this other stuff. Uh, but that same, but the reason why I brought that up and I've been bringing it up you know, in other <laughs> interviews is because I'm thinking about this is essentially what you're doing when what you're mastering is the game of your inbox. Yeah. Like I, I, I'm going to clear this thing out. Okay. You, yes, everyone's getting what they need. I'm following up at this. And like, I'm, I'm very responsive and I get everyone answers quickly and I'm always on my phone at all times. So you yeah. never, you're always going to answer pretty quickly and I'm never the thing that's going to slow down. I'm never going to be the link in the chain that makes yeah. the whole thing pull through slower. Right. Um, you're the assistant who's great at manning the phones. Even if right. you have a high level job in some sense, that's the wrong game to be playing well. Yeah. Because ultimately the CEO is not the person who was, you're so great at answering emails quickly. You're right. It's you're, you're never actually measured yeah, you, on that. You want them to go, Hey, come in this meeting with me. Yeah. Like don't just set it. You, you, you want to be sending the signal that like you're, you have something to contribute. Yes. Not that you're you're good at getting coffee or yeah. whatever. It or is. I produce when you give me a project. Yeah. Like I knock it out of the park. Yeah. Like that's good. And then they you're like, okay, oh, you're slow in answering these emails, but you know what? This is important. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to give this report to Ryan because yeah. like it's going to be really good. Yeah. Yeah. Like he's a really good researcher and his writing sharp. And the last thing was really impressive. Uh, so yeah, I don't 
care about the yeah i'm gonna bother this other person over here with like the small stuff because like he's really quick at answering on emails yeah and by the way that that can be someone that can be someone who who likes that and wants to be good at it and yeah. and the funny thing is when you find those people uh you're so excited to find those people yeah. and they can command their own you know salary and benefits and demands because so many of the people that you tend to hire or see for those positions see it as a stepping stone and don't want to be in it yeah. and there's a cost to that right because yep. you're having to constantly replace those yeah. people yeah, and that's so no good either so it's yep. figuring the thing that you want to be good at that moves the needle for you yeah but don't and, accidentally yes. become an assistant yes when you're seven steps up that that's what i think happens when you play the game of email yeah is you could be an executive right but you're playing the game of the assistant by like what I'm good at is answering emails really quickly and people get quick responses because ultimately there's no friction or traction on that that actually generates direct value, right? What's the thing you produced that we sold? What's the client relationship that brought in a lot more money? What is the new insight on which we built a new business strategy? None of that. It's not playing that game. So you can very high up the chain. I mean, I see professors fall into this a lot. You know, this is like an assistant professor trap. Because yeah. you have to know as an assistant professor, the game you are playing is publishing. Yeah. It's the only game you're playing, yeah. right? Like that, you were going to lose your job after seven years if you don't publish a lot. That's how it works. We're going to temporarily give you this job. If by the end of seven years, you have not gotten tenure, you have to go. And how do you get tenure? We solicit confidential letters from the top researchers in your field. And all they talk about is how important is his or her work. Right. That's it. Yeah. Right. You can't get tenure by teaching really well. You can't get tenure through politics because it's it's confidential letter writers looking at your research. You can't get tenure through I did a bunch of committees and I was really useful or the dean likes yeah. me or all these things people think goes on. It's your work. Yeah. Your research. How important was it? Right. And these letters are brutal, by the way. I've been on the other side of this. It is here are the institutions at which this person would get tenure and would not. Here are the three people that I think are most comparable to this person right now. This is two people who are better than this person right now. I would say this person is a little bit worse. Like it is, you know, yeah, yeah, it's sure. like the NFL combine, yeah, yeah. but with, you know, publishing papers basically. So an assistant professor has to learn that's all that really matters. Right. All right. Now, once you know that, try not to be, you know, too annoying to other people. Yeah, yeah. But try to every, be horrible. Don't be horrible. <laughs> but like, this is not your game. Yeah, yeah. And a, a big trap for assistant professors is they get stuck in the game because it's scary. The publication game is scary because you know that might not look like anything today. Right. It's, it's it's played on the scale of years. Right. So they feel much more comfortable. I'm answering all the emails. I'm joining all the committees. I'm very responsive and useful. I'm taking on because right. they want to create a sense of like I'm doing things and I'm busy. And then when the tenure time comes, it's, hey, where's your papers? Well, you could you could argue the same is true for a college student, right? So you get into the college, you're at an elite university or a mediocre university, it doesn't really matter. And if you think success at the end of that four years is like what your grades are, yeah. uh, you've probably screwed up, right? Even if you're trying to get into grad school, because really it, it matters what relationships have you formed, what things have you learned, yeah. right? Um, what if you found out you really don't want to do, right? So if like you spend four years... Uh, getting great grades and you get into a law school, but you haven't figured out like that you hate the law. Yeah. That's a huge failure. Yeah. Uh, but but also like if you if you for most students who aren't going to be d continuing on, nobody's going to care about your GPA ever again. Yeah. So if if that's the game that you're playing, you're setting yourself up not to be very successful because you the the important thing was oh I learned these people or I I I got a job at this place or you you, know, you have to be figuring out big. Th big things that are gonna gonna matter five, ten, twenty years from now. Yeah, and 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 the things that are very easily measured and clear uh, don't matter even then, and they're definitely not gonna matter down the road. It could be even worse, right? I, I had this exact experience, right? So so early in grad school, I'm at MIT. I had published these two books about how to be a good student, right? Uh, and I had a blog, yeah. and, and so I had this great idea. I was like, what I'm going to do is uh, mentor a collection of students from Boston area colleges who are struggling. Yeah. Um, and what I'll do in my mind was, oh, I'll just apply my advice, yeah. and they're going to be A, a students yeah. and, and happy. And then everyone will see how good my advice works and buys my books, right? So one of the students, uh, I called her Lena. It wasn't her real name, but I called her Lena. I wrote about this on my blog. This is you know t almost 20 years sure. ago now. Um, so she came to me and she broke this, she broke my whole understanding yeah. because she came to me and was saying, uh, yeah, I'm really 
I'm stressed out. I'm struggling and my grades aren't where I want them to be or whatever. And so I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Let's build a calendar. I used to, you know, let's, I call it autopilot schedule. Let's just take your activities and classes, figure out what work is due regularly, find time for it on the calendar. You know, just a standard thing. Yeah. I started doing this for her and we ran out of hours. Like I, we, we, yeah. we ran out of hours for her to work because she was double majoring with a minor and had like nine different activities yeah. and like it, it didn't fit. So it wasn't, her problem was not, Oh, grades are what matters. It was actually uh, a college admissions mindset that said activities, quantity of activities, yeah, sure, extracurricular. Sure, sure. So you had all this stuff. And I was like, okay, I mean, Lena, look, it literally doesn't fit into your schedule, right? So yeah. we, we have to slice and dice, like get rid of all these activities, cut down the one major, like just do something well, but give yourself time to also be, you know, a person, a student. She couldn't do it, huh. right? And it turned out what happened was, uh, you know, her whole town, her whole family was like, oh my God, she got into MIT. Like all of their yeah. hopes were on her shoulders. And so she felt like I have to do really well here. Yeah. But she didn't know the game that mattered. So the yeah. only game she knew was, well, the way I got into college was by doing a lot I of I did stuff. a lot of things. Yeah. So she's like, if I'm not doing a lot of things, right. how else will I signal that I'm being impressive? And I owe it yeah. to all these people to be impressive. Uh, so she had a mental breakdown and had to <laughs> leave. I think she eventually came back, but yeah. she had to, you know, right. uh, take a long leave of absence and, you know, come back because she couldn't get out of that game. Right. And I was telling her like, look, if you want to go to grad school, I'm in grad. Let me tell you how yeah. this works. How do you get into grad school? Let's say you want to go to grad school. You want to get a doctorate. Um, you do need to have a good GPA in your field. You need to be a really good student in your field. But that means don't do anything else. Yeah, right. Don't do double majors. Right. Why would you double major? Yeah. Don't have seven activities. Uh, grad school admissions is decided by a group of professors. I've been on this committee many times. I've yeah. run it before. They don't care what activities you're in. Right. All they care about, can you come and contribute to our research? So what matters is you did very well in specifically that field and that you've, uh, you got involved in research so you can signal, here's a paper or two I got involved in as an undergraduate. I, am, uh, I can handle doing research. Yeah. I was like, nothing else matters. Huh. Right. Like, so that was the game. Yeah. But she was playing the wrong game and it completely burnt her out. Like it completely held her back. Yeah. Knowing what game you're playing, that's kind of the ultimate thing. Uh, I found this with Daily Stoke early on. So when we started the Daily Stoke Instagram, we would just do like quotes every day. Right. Yeah. And then um, there'd just be quotes from the Stoke, be like a, the picture of a Stoke and then a quote. And then, uh, you know, like I would have a book coming out or we'd, we'd be making something and I'd I'd go. um Hey, it's Ryan. Like I'm, you know, have this thing. And yeah. Be like, who the fuck are you? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I realized that the thing that was getting the most engagement by itself, uh, so growing the account, um, wasn't checking one of the primary boxes of all of it, which was to develop a relationship with people. So it was not an email newsletter yet. It was. No, this is just the. It, the I mean, it was, it was all Instagram. these things. Yeah. But yeah. Let's say I was like, "Hey, sign up for the email." They're like, "What email? What book?" Yeah. You know, they didn't know. Yeah. They, they all they were seeing were these quotes, right? And they didn't. It was devoid of any connection to any larger thing. Yeah. And so one of the reasons that Daily Stoic, I became more involved in it as a person, even though it's not really what I'm as comfortable with, yeah. is that it became impossible. Uh, without it to, to actually deliver anything but the quotes. Yeah. Wait, let me ask you about this because I'm fascinated yeah. by this, right? Okay. Because, I mean, that's what really, like, your whole empire really took off, right? Sure. I mean, yeah. so, I mean, I've known you a long time, yeah. right? I mean, it was it was ryanholiday.net. Yes. And the reading list email, uh -huh. right? Which, yeah. which was still around. Yeah. Uh, that's still around. So when Daily Stoic, so yeah. you're saying when you first conceived the Daily Stoic, you weren't quite playing the first game. You saw it as like, here's a spin off thing. I actually saw a Daily that's Stoic. That's going to just put out quotes, and it's not really me. It's like another business. Well, I was attracted to it because it was a brand that was not me. I thought it yeah. was, this would be like a relief. This would be yes. better. And, and actually, it could be more because it's not me. Oh, you probably, I could have other writers. Yeah, yeah, other, exactly. Right. Uh, it, Obstacle had come out at this point. Obstacle had come out. Ego, all, or was this right after Ego? Ego came well? out too. Th this is all around when Daily Stoke, the book came out. So like you're, like, you're like, I'm going to write this book, so I might as well have the domain. And then you're like, why don't I have a, a, a the domain brand? The domain was $6,000, yeah. I remember. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, 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 the idea was it was going to be this brand that wasn't me. And so it worked. At first, the brand grew very quickly uh, and it was doing well. But it was there was a it turned out there's actually a ceiling when there's not a person involved because yes. it's not personalized and people trust people. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so so um, I see this now. There's all these other. It's funny, right? Like when when we did it, uh, 
nobody thought it was anything and it didn't seem like it would work. And now, of course, there's all these other people that want to rip it off that do their own like copycat versions of it, right? You mean like daily, but something else? Or no, 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 stoic. Like the, there's the stoic daily or, you know, there's like a thousand <laughs> Instagram accounts, yeah. right? But like the every other day stoic, it, it, yeah. it might, it might as well be AI. It might, it, it yeah. could be some troll farm somewhere that's doing it because there is no person attached to it. So yeah. it bumps up into the ceiling in which they're all, uh, replaceable there there is no actual personal real connection with any of them yeah and it's there there is no there is no relationship it's just like i get quotes and i don't actually care even who's delivering the quotes does that make sense yeah so then how do you describe the game you figured out matters is what people want is a they want an exemplar of this approach to life that they're able to have uh be like a daily interaction with it's not just i want to be more stoic they like i want to have like a ryan I want it holiday to be explained sp- to me and uh articulated to me and embodied yeah. to me and i want it to feel real yeah and uh attainable and all these yeah. other things that you only a person can do so the shifts then would be i'm deconstructing your business yeah. here but <laughs> so the shifts here would be uh not just quotes, but yeah. let's have more like a, like short 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 term videos, and you, and you have, article right. Oh, yeah, and you yes. have first person in the articles yeah. sometimes, right? Um, more you, right? So like you get a YouTube strategy going, uh-huh. right? Like and and you you invest it up front, like uh-huh. you know we're gonna do produced videos, yeah, which is not necessarily the play if what you're trying to do was maximize like views or, or YouTube views right off the bat, yeah, but was a good play for. Inter, you know, right here's Ryan Holiday. Like here he is. He's on his ranch. Here he is walking. Like get to see yes. you again and again. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that got into it. Your socials were doing more. There's more video, more photo. Would you say? I mean, you'd have probably already moved out here, right? Yes. But yes, but yes, you were yes. leaning into that as I live on a ranch. Like I'm you, not you living in to, the you city. Have to show it. It, yeah. you can't just be. Is the you books? Know, was a the bookstore disembodied voice? Yeah. With a message because. Uh, how can I trust that? How, what 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 affinity? What connection yeah. do I have to it? What does it actually mean to me? How do I know that it's real? So I'm, then I'm going to argue. I guess this yeah. is what you're thinking: is yeah. the painted porch is another masterstroke in this plan, right? Because like, I mean, it you're giving a you're like uh, people, especially in an age of visuals, there's an embodiment of like yeah. Ryan, like lives in texas and has this bookstore and he's there and like people are in the look we're in the like near the bookstore and there's books everywhere and uh, you know it, it gives a okay i don't know if it's a master stroke but it was the idea that like well it was something i wanted to do anyway but but yes it, it's it's a physical man it's it's a physical manifestation yeah. that again if you're just like a rip off instagram account you could never afford to do yeah. and never would do and, yeah. and never could pull off so yeah. so yeah but ma- making it real and and i think it's interesting right like do you read your own audiobooks i did for the first time um so i actually think that you you wouldn't think that was important I, and it, 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 is. Ta- it yeah. takes a, it takes a lot of work like i have to do another one uh, here very shortly but then you go okay wait um there somebody is going to th- this audiobook is 7 hours long so somebody is going to have a seven-hour connection with yep. this material. Is it going to be with me, or is it going to be with an intermediary between me and that person? Yeah. And uh, you know, so maybe on the one hand, not having a professional narrator, it could decrease your reach because you're not as good at it. I'm not yeah. as good at it as whoever the best audiobook reader in the world is. Yeah. But is that the game that I'm trying to play? Maximum reach, or is it? Is it is it also about depth? Yeah. And do I want to when someone's deciding to have someone talk, or when someone's deciding, hey, this is a difficult moment in my life. Uh, do I does this thing did this thing resonate with me? Yes or no? It's going to be um, like whose voice was in their ear. Yeah. Does that I mean, make sense? Like it's a funny a funny trivia tidbit. Yeah. It's the audio book for deep work. Won an award in an audio an audio book awards. There, I guess there's some yeah, ceremony. Sure. It won an award. Jeff Bottoms had a hat tip. Not you, not me, right? Ooh. So it's kind of funny. Like, okay, yeah, that was so good. It won an award, but it wasn't playing the right game. You yes. know, you know what switches it over? Why I had to do it is uh, like, will you podcast now? Yes. I'm like, okay, right. so here's hundreds of thousands of people who now have this you know, relationship. Who's this other person? It's going to be yeah. really weird to have another voice that's like your your voice is well known. But that's one of the reasons why I got into podcasting yeah. is it's relationship. And, and so in like the writing sense, those old student books I wrote, for example, like some of those have sold hundreds of thousands of copies now. Yeah. They didn't sell that 
in 2006. It's because right. once there's a relationship with a well, writer, at like, this let me go point read it's his probably other stuff. parents are giving it to their kids, like people who read it. They have. It's yes. really pe- distressing. Parental fans of yours are giving it to their kids who are now in high school. Yeah. It, it is. Yeah, it is distressing that yeah. I have. Yeah, people or people who read it. Maybe they went back. They actually read it in school. <laughs> yeah. And now are talking about yeah. their own kids. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah that That's is the weird. problem when you start writing when you're young. Yeah. Uh, okay, so games that matter. I know this sounds writing yeah. specific. No, no, but but this is like this is the challenge I think for almost you know anything someone's doing. Yeah, what where where are the people that you're trying to reach? Where are they? What actually connects with them? Not, and, and there is this. It feels arrogant, but figuring out that actually most of the things that your industry does or that people do are not winning that game. Yeah, and it's there's a, a certain amount of artifice to it, or just inertia to it and that you have to you have to figure out what that stuff is and then not do it so what about this element and I'm, all right so this element also seems important um all right so you're trying to find the right game the other factor here that seems to be important in people who end up winning is when you get that gut instinct of i think I found the right yeah. game like i you know you just it's yeah. clicking or whatever the willingness to push all the chips in that seems to come up a lot yeah. where this is working. Let's really hammer on what's So to me, working. the first thing you do is you, you have this. Okay, so you are you haven't been in this industry for 20 years. You just started this thing. You're yeah. some kid or you are you have this idea for business and you go, you know, the way that this industry or this product is done or whatever, it's totally wrong. It's just nonsensical how inefficient it is. The first thing you should do is not trust that impulse. Yeah. The thing you have thought about for three seconds yeah. is you, probably not smarter than all the institutional wisdom and tradition and self-interest operating in that space. So f- the first thing you have to do is go figure it out. So yeah. you're like, hey, I don't know, the way they sell things at convenience stores is dumb and it could be better. Like. You actually have to go spend some time behind the counter at a place or you have to spend hours and hours watching how it goes or, you know, why isn't there a book about this? Well, chances are there's not a book about this because nobody wants a book about that. Right. Or or whatever. Right. And you have to figure out you have to you have to look for disconfirmation first and foremost that your hunch or hypothesis or, you know, like insight into an established industry or space uh, is not true because it's probably not true. Yeah. And so I think that is that is a very undervalued step, right? Yes. Because it, especially if you have been successful with other instincts like that in the past, you start to believe you have this Midas touch yeah. or this know-it-all syndrome and that's when you blow up. Right. Okay, then I'm gonna, I'll I'll add on to that also understanding how that world works. Yes. Right? So okay, I think I've thought about selling things to convenience stores. Yeah. Let me find out why don't people sell it that way. Yeah. Also, how does one start a company that yeah. like puts stuff in convenience stores? Yeah. Like, what's the reality of where those co- goes are their margin? Like, I always tell people, for me, the most important you know phone call probably in my life is when I decided to write a book. Uh, I called a family friend who was an agent and said, "Explain to me." How do people sell books? Yeah. And in particular, what would be the very narrow path that like a 20 or 21 year old could follow to sell a book? And she was like, this is how the industry actually works. Yes. And I don't know how many other, you know, young people like bright, precocious or an Ivy League school, like, I'm going to write a book or whatever. Yeah. And it goes nowhere because you don't do that step either. Yes. You're like, I'm just going to, you know, I, I had this exact conversation with someone. He came to one of my talks and um, he wanted to write a book. Yeah. I was like, okay, I have my standard advice for writing a book. And he had this whole like alternative world built out about how he was going to end run around the whole. It involved yeah. him spending a lot of money yeah. on these marketing firms. And these marketing firms were going to get like a lot of attention to his self-published book. And and then the publishers were going to come to him <laughs> and say like, you know, you this is so great. And I was like, why would you do all of that? Like, there's a very specific path that works really well. They're desperate for good books. And it's a yeah. great like threshold function to see if your idea is good. He didn't want to have anything to do with it. Yeah. Right. So, you know, understanding is, is this idea really good? Don't trust yourself. Yeah. How does this world really work? Yeah. yeah. Then I would say like, wait till you have traction. Uh-huh. Like I've made money. I've sold things. So like, yeah. okay, like I'm actually in playing in this world now yes until i'm playing in the world i'm not ready to make my big swing probably either you know like uh-huh. so i think that comes into it as well yep but then knowing because it can be hard to figure out like again I, I think about your story like a lot of pieces came together writing about stoicism 
which, you know, your original decision to do that was not part of some master plan. No. And I've told you before, like those of us who knew you back then thought you were crazy. Yeah, my uh, my my editor told me later that she thought um, it would just not work and then I would go back to doing the other. So my publisher was like, we were just humoring you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Who I've now sold millions of books on that topic for. So yeah, it, it, and yeah. but it is important. It wasn't a huge bet. No, you know but, what I mean? but, but I'm saying that was like one of several elements, right? Yes. So it was like that, like, oh, that's kind of working. But there's a couple books and a planner in there uh -huh. before that really established. Moving to Daily Stoic as a, a, a separate entity, but then making Daily Stoic around you, yeah. visual branding as well. And at some point, you know, those things all started clicking together. And then it's, okay, we're going to do the Four Cardinal Virtues books. We're going to, you know, really push the, yeah. the, the, the studio quality podcast. Mm -hmm. You know, the plays... It was like you push chips in, right? Yes. You know, so it's like you're waiting for your moment. I think like Andrew Huberman did something similar. Yeah, he was going around doing all these interviews during COVID. Yeah, and was feeling like something here is working. Like yeah. I just something about being a, a, a he's a realizing professor. he's good on camera. Good on camera. His things are spreadable. I have authority, but someone he's with a hearing from an audience. Like he's probably getting lots of emails back from people who are like, "Your thing changed my well, life." There was, I, there's these yeah. articles being written about yeah. him, and his interviews were blowing up on these big podcasts. And he's like, "Oh, this works. I'm I'm talking in the way of practical advice, but I'm not just." You know, whatever yeah. and so he's like let's just do let's push the chips in on this great yeah. let's like this yeah. is what i need to do twice a week like let's do this like do the research and like just put out these episodes and uh and you know all that sort of takes off too or like lex fridman realizing like the ai podcast which he'd been doing forever you know forever he was just interviewing uh scientists mainly about ai and other technology and there was this like pandemic moment where he's like oh no one's doing anything. Yeah. And if I fly around the country and test myself every day and set up studios and hotel rooms, I could talk to a lot of people. Yeah. And like, that was kind of working. Like, let's go all in on that. I'm going to, this is, this is what's working is my interview style. Not the, not the fact I'm talking about AI. Anyways, you sort of see this, right. You see this come up like, okay, now that something's working, go for it. Yes. What do you feel like of your, advice or strategies like what do you feel like you're the biggest hypocrite about like what do you feel like you struggle actually applying the most i think this book slow productivity is like the most of the books i've written where it's a question i have i want to be better at uh -huh. like really something i'm really working at like when i wrote deep work for example it was yeah i came out of this environment the theory group at mit in which like focus was the number one thing it was yeah. like extreme focus it was we could stare for hours and yeah. i was like trying to ex bring this to more like hey there's this thing we learned in this narrow world which is more broadly applicable than we think right i was trying yeah. to bring this message out there digital minimalism i never had a social media account right right and and so uh, i was talking about like why you need to be careful about this and how do you build like, like i have an intentional relationship with technology how do you build that too yeah. you know it's, it's connecting to that this i was actually motivated by real problems in my life right i mean i i am slow productive right i don't i i don't like busyness um i do not like having schedules on a regular basis that are packed yeah like a big thing for me is i i need work as much as possible to be in a scenario where it makes no difference if you work tomorrow or not but if yeah. you don't work a lot this month like you're in trouble yeah, sure. right no, that's like that's time. my sweet yeah. spot right yeah. But still, things creep, yeah. and I'm, I'm constant tension. So, like, what pushed me over the edge to writing this book was my three boys got all the elementary school age, yeah. And like, when they got the elementary school age, it swapped to this point where they needed like every minute I had, yeah. Right, like the tension between work and non-work became less of a pragmatic thing, you know. Like, hey, who, what toddler needs to be taken where, yeah. and we make sure everyone's getting a break. And it became more like. They need as much time as possible with me. It made that tension really palpable. And so I was like, I got to really, I really got to clean up my understanding of these intuitions and instincts I have about slowly working towards what matters because I've accreted a lot of things yeah. as I've gotten better and gotten more stature and the opportunities are everywhere. And I felt like I was in danger of, uh, of impeding my own progress. So this slow productivity is probably the book like I most had myself in mind as a reader. I mean, I do it. But this clarified what I'm trying to do so I could do it much better. Yeah. It, the way most people set their lives up, the way sort of business and life is set up, I think we don't maybe compute enough like who gets screwed the most in that system because the workers are miserable. They're sitting in the cubicle. Yeah. They're not happy. They're inundated with email. Yeah. But like the person who gets the, the, the people who get the short end of that sticker are our children. I was thinking about this. Like, yeah. like 
I know how I'm able to drop my kids off at school at, you know, like 8.30 or 9 or whatever and pick them up before like 3 o'clock or whatever. I don't understand how someone with a job could possibly do that. Yeah. Like, it's insane. Yeah. Who who can work from 9 to 3? Yeah. Right? That, that's not a, that's not yeah. a day. Um, and, and, and so what – this is obviously where daycare comes in and nannies come in and in-laws come in. But it's also, by definition, uh, a, a world I think back to my own childhood where – I probably saw my parents for like an hour or two a day. You know what I mean? Interesting. And yep. then and then the weekend was like catch up and obviously they were burned out. Yeah. And then um I like or they wanted to do stuff and I wanted to be home because I wasn't home all day. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so you, you think about how what what I if you can get what you would call slow uh productivity or you might call like an artist life, what's what's so wonderful about it is the flexibility to be like, oh, my kid is sick. Okay, I'll just spend all day with you today. Or yeah. like, uh, you have a half day. I'll pick you up. Let's do that. Like you, you or you run into my office. Yeah, focus is important, and and, and I, I like to lock in what I'm doing. But I also can turn it on and off yep. if I need to, right? Yeah. Because yeah, I'm measuring it not in terms of what did I get done today, or my boss is going to be breathing down my neck. But I measure it in terms of like months or years. Yeah, and so like the 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 system of i don't know what the opposite of slow productivity would be but like pseudo productivity yeah that's the but, term i use yeah. but but i mean i mean the way like corporate america yeah. and life is set up that the the bl large blocks of hours away from where you live like focused only on this thing yeah the people who suffer from that system the most are children yeah i agree with that right i mean and, and the system i it's I use the term pseudo productivity because yeah. we give it a definition. I always define things, um, but I think pseudo productivity is using visible activity as a proxy for useful expert. Yeah. Right? That's what we did in knowledge work, and we did it because there's no other easy way to measure productivity in a factory. There's easy ways to do this. Right? There's yeah. numbers, model T's per labor hour. Uh, in agriculture, there's ways to do this. Bushels of crop sure. per acre of land, yeah. and you had really clearly defined systems. Oh, I, I, I switched from the craft method to the continuous motion assembly line. This Model T per hour number went uh, up by a factor of 10. This is a better way to do it. Knowledge yeah. work had none of this, right? Yeah. I'm working on seven things. It's unclear what I'm doing. It's different than what you're doing. You have no idea how I'm organizing my work. That's up to me. So we had no numbers. Yeah. So we fell back on pseudo productivity, right? Okay, activity will be our proxy for useful effort. This was okay, when it was, uh, we all gather at an office for a set amount of time anyways. And then it was just a game of, you know, don't be seen reading the magazine during the day. <laughs> but my argument, this is like the first part of the book, is that when we got the front office IT revolution, so especially when we got network computers, portable computing, and then ubiquitous wireless internet, now you had the ability to demonstrate activity on a very fine granularity um, at all times. Yeah. Because you could send an email anywhere. Sure, right? sure, sure. You could do a Slack message anywhere. You could jump onto these calls anywhere. You could do your work from home. And that's what put us then into this constant tension between work and everything else. And so, yeah. uh, so I think it was pseudo productivity plus digital. Yeah. Because I'm a techno critic, so everything kind of comes back to that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Those two things together is when the wheels begin to spin off the, the bus. And you can actually see this by looking at. Uh, business advice literature, like books, like the popular books, right? So in the 80s and 90s, he was like the big name is going to be Stephen Covey, right? So you get Seven Habits, you get First Things First. Read these books. They're very optimistic. They're all about self-actualization. If you've ever read these books, it's like you figure out your roles in life. Yeah. And, uh, and then you're building, you know, there's this optimism of with using these quad charts and priority systems. I'm going to figure out the right things to do that allow me to actualize all the things I care about. What do you get in the early 2000s? David Allen. Right. How to manage your inboxes and, or your alerts and, and all that. And not stuff. even manage, like survive. Yeah. You go back and read David Allen, uh, what you get, what's his goal? occasional moments of Zen-like peace among the deluge. Mind like, there's nothing in there. turning you into a processing machine. And a survival processing yeah. machine, right? So clearly the biggest thing afflicting David Allen when he's writing that book is just the sheer overload. And he doesn't even attempt to say, let's make work meaningful like it is with Stephen Covey. Let's not yeah. try to actualize our values. It is, can we find a way to be cranking widgets all day without going insane? And his whole methodology is about how to just get stuff out of your mind and on the list so you can just execute blindly off the list and it won't give you stress. Right. Right. It's because the whole, what changed between the 90s and the early 2000s, it was email, it was computers, it was like the rise right. of laptops. And most of the business, the best selling business advice literature since then 
it's like essentialism. Yeah. It's one thing. It's yeah. deep work. Right? Yeah. It's these books that are all about trying to go back, escape overload, yeah. get away. And then it's the whole anti-productivity, anti-work movement. This yeah. has been the whole literature ever since the early 2000s. So it, I, this is what I think happens. If your only definition is more is better than less. And then you give people the opportunity to visibly do work at every moment of their life. Those two things don't play well together. Yeah. And I think that's why we get this burnout epidemic that just starts in the early 2000s. And it just goes, 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 goes. And then the pandemic sort of pushes people over the edge and they're saying enough. Right. So what's the relationship between productivity and walks? Because I feel like people who are truly productive, not people who sit at their desk and pound at things all day, but I, th I feel like people who have big scientific breakthroughs, artists, people who have theories about the world, whatever, there seems to be a, an undeniable relationship with walks. Yeah. Well, it, it, they, they come up all the time and there's, there's a, a good neurological reason for it. Um, but first, like where walks become important is once you realize what's important is like we were talking about before, actually having the valuable idea, like figuring out something good. It's not just writing, which we can use with like scare quotes yeah. is like just yeah. doing stuff. Right. You actually have to think, right. Um, walks are really common historically for big thinkers. We think like this, it, we don't, it's not exactly nailed down, but we think what's going on is that the, the motor neurons involved in walking actually act as a bit of a dampener on certain circuits in your brain, right? So part of your brain now gets into these, uh, autonomous motion loops, which acts as a dampener on essentially neural noise. So huh. more distracting thoughts yeah. or asides, you're thinking about this or that. So when you're sitting still, sometimes the problem is um, there's not enough dampening going on in your brain. And so it's hard to sustain your focus. Right. When you're walking, it puts on some cognitive blinders. You have an easier time holding your focus on an interior abstract idea. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's jerry-rigging your brain to be better at this thing that's pretty artificial for humans to do, which is to hold abstract ideas in our mind's eye. And, uh, you know, this is not what we evolved to do. We're, we're, well, we're certainly that. not evolved to just sit down for long periods of time either, but we are evolved to cover long distances and yeah. look for things and explore places. And so take in information yeah. while we're yeah. walking and process, right? Yeah. So all we're doing different now in the modern world is uh, we're just turning the eye inward. Yeah. So instead of taking in information across the savanna and kind of processing all this information, instead we're walking on the river walk in Bostrop. Yeah. Um, we can just turn that eye inner and yeah. put it on in internal things. But yeah, it's the same idea. So, so walking, yeah, it's super common. That's why. I mean, I do all of my best thinking, all of my best thinking walking. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. Nietzsche said only ideas have had while walking have any worth. Nietzsche walked a lot. Yeah. Uh, Kierkegaard would walk just all like hours a day. Hours, I yeah. mean, Aristotle's school is named after his movements, his walking, yeah. right? And so, yeah, there there is, it's almost inseparable scientific discovery, philosophical, uh, philosophical discourse, and walking. You know Even the though champion? the the irony is, when we think of the philosophers, yeah. we think of them standing in the Lyceum or in the school, or like we see yeah. them stationary. But in fact, they were always in motion. Yeah, you yeah you read uh, yeah you read the the dial the various dialogues yeah. right the Aristotelian yeah. dialogues and yeah they're walking. <laughs> it's Socrates with Phaedrus yeah. and they're walking by the river as they're yeah. talking right. That's the way it unfolds. You know who uh, the champion walker in the arts right now is? David Sedaris. Oh, doesn't he walk around and pick up trash? He all does. Day? He will. But these walks he does are epic. Yeah, like crazy walks. Like when he's in Manhattan, he'll like walk from the battery like all the way up to like the upper west like he'll just yeah. walk the whole island or whatever he'll walk 10 15 miles no he he uh he got an award from the queen because he would just take these walks and then he started picking up trash while he was on the walks which i also do uh like uh, i live on this dirt road and so I'll, I'll sort of walk it over and over again and it's like oh, there's another nail you know or whatever sometimes it's it's not it's even worse than that but but yeah there's something about you're doing this thing, so there's not really any expectations that you should be working yeah. or that you should have the breakthrough. And perhaps that's where it comes from too, like Archimedes in the bath or whatever. It's when you're when you've turned it's still operating in the background because you can't turn it off. Yeah. The, the the thing that's working on the problem. But when you stop being so willful about it, something unlocks and it's yeah. very powerful. And it comes to you. Yep. Yes. Do you also get I get this in my town people think you're eccentric. Like you probably get it worse here. You know, like I, I live in a little town outside of DC, but it, I walk the yeah. same loops yeah. through my neighborhood and they're like, Oh, there goes, I mean, they know it now yes. because we're a small enough town. Yeah. Uh, but people are like, why do you walk so much? I was like, this is what I do for a living. 
I think well, the 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 way that it has intersected with my life is, you know, it's like, okay, so you got to get on the phone with someone for this thing. And uh, I'll send you the invite. And then I don't look at the invite until, you know, I'm about to get on. And it's like, oh, this is like a Zoom call with 15 people. I'm already walking. So then now I have to make up this excuse for why uh, it's loud where I am or that I'm not at my computer. Like, oh, I'm out in the country. And so, you know, I'm trying to get, but, I'm trying to get reception. Yeah exactly, yeah, exactly. But, but it's like, I can't, I already didn't want to do this call. Yeah. And if you told me that to do this call, I had to sit at my desk for 30 minutes and not move or be outside. I'd want to do it even less, yeah. you know? And so, so yeah, I do almost all my phone calls walking. So sometimes that can be weird in a small town because people are like, Oh, Hey, I want to talk. And I'm like, you know, uh, but, but yeah, I try, I try to, I try to move. Um, also, yeah, the, the only one that caused problems for me, is like, if you're doing like therapy or whatever, if you do it over the phone and it's like, I don't know if I should be talking about this like out <laughs> yeah. in the thing, but I also, again, don't just want to sit there for no reason for an yeah. hour. And so, yeah, I think, I think being active and moving, it's first off, it's just better than being sedentary yeah. for you physically. And then m- psychologically and mentally, there's just something very, very powerful. So we have about three, we, we, we're going to write a book about this, yeah. Ryan. So we have three elements of what we're going to call the artist life. Right okay. Now, right. We've discussed yeah. three elements, right? So, um, one is the, the work expectations are tomorrow doesn't matter, but this month does. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, two, you can be done by three Yes. and start at nine. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the, the third one is you can spend a lot of time walking. Yes. Like that to me, mm-hmm. my heart's singing, right? Like that's all yeah, I that's want. That's a great life. That's, that's a great all day. I want. Yeah. Yeah. Now I do it a little differently because I'm a, uh, I'm a believer in seasonality. Okay. Right. So different seasons being different than others. This is like an old professor thing. Right. Um, and so it'll look different for me where this semester might be my teaching semester. So I largely mm. now just teach in one semester. Yeah. So, you know, a, a lot of these days I'm going on the campus and I'm meeting with students and it's like, a, it's, it's a sure. academic life, but then there'll be like a, a, another semester when I'm going to campus one day a week and I'm more yeah. at my studio and writing. And then the summers we disappear. Yeah. Right. And we'll, we often go up to new England and then it's like, I'm completely off the grid. And like the right. only thing I'm doing is book writing, maybe right. like some New Yorker work, but probably just book writing. So I, I, I lean in the seasonality. So sometimes that's the answer It's like, well, I still want to be a professor. Right. So, um, sometime it's not all going to be, I'm done at three or I'm walking a lot because some days I'm in the classroom and have a meeting with the Dean. So why not make that this season of the year and this, and then on bigger time scales too, like I'm doing book publicity now. Yeah. Um, this is not, if I had to operate like this, yeah, this is the worst. It's the worst. <laughs> it's just, the, I mean, it's fun for like a while because I get yeah. to see people, but it's like the worst because it's not the, this is the fun yeah. part. The worst is like my, my email right now. I, there must yeah. be seven different teams. Yeah. That all are just like, we need this. Can you do this? Can you get back to me on this? There's well, the it UK starts to team. feel There's like the... it's probably for you a glimpse of what regular life is for a lot of people. I think if you're like a higher level executive yeah. that like a lot of people needed things yeah. from, it probably feels like book tour all the time. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, the seasonality thing is interesting and it, it's, it's probably a throwback to uh, an older way of life. You know, it's like, politicians you know the washington would clear out during the summer because it was a malarial swamp or whatever right or or yeah school you know has always sort of been in the seasons but 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 people used to do things that way whereas now and i find myself doing it i i am much more of a like well what does my ideal day look like and i'm just going to do that all the time I, I, i but there is probably something unrealistic and unnatural about doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again and not having uh, large chunks of time where you're doing it differently and you're forced to re-examine and question and try it a new way in a new place. And so I am I am trying, especially as my kids are getting older and now, hey, yeah, this is the season we're in school. So if I had some idea that like, uh, I don't do meetings on Friday and I'm, work, I'm gonna stay at home. Well, that was great when they were two. Yeah. Because they were around, but now they're gone all day. So yeah, I might so as well do. Go. I yeah. might as well. So so yeah. Re- I think the rhythms of oh, this is baseball season, and then the rhythms of this is you know this is the winter, and not only are the hours shorter, but we're all sick all the time. Yeah. So the hell with your plans. You know yeah. what I mean? The, yeah. the season of accepting that that instead of having a routine, you have a series of routines, yeah. and you rotate either seasonally or day to day or different days of the week through which one makes the most sense. So I, I had a couple of weeks ago, a New York Times op-ed on this idea, like yeah. on seasonality. And one of the things I was arguing is, is this is so valuable, the humans, right? It's because it's the way we lived until 
evolutionary okay. speaking, like a blink ago. This um, is when we're farming. This is when we hunt the buffalo. Yeah, this is yeah and, I went, and I went back to all of that. Yeah, yeah. It's all over the place. I also do, I wrote a long New Yorker piece about this last year, too, where I looked at what do we know about hunter-gatherers yeah. and like what work looked like for them. Um, it's it's important enough that it's worth sacrifices as well. Yeah. So like, here's something I'm considering. Uh because I still, I'm not, my podcast is not with a network. We still sell yeah. ads, you know, directly with an agency. And you sell ads, as you know, like a year in advance. Basically, yeah. you fill out the year ahead. Yeah. So I'm thinking about for the next year, talking, you, you know, you know my agency. I yeah. uh, hope they're not listening. But <laughs> <laughs> saying. Um, I still work with them. They're great. Yeah, they're great. But I'm, I'm thinking about saying, let's not sell 52 weeks. Hmm. Right? In fact, let's take, uh, why don't we sell like 45 or 46 weeks? And I am going, because I'm not going to podcast in July and I'll just you? batch the production and sell all year round. Well, I could do that too, but then that's also more like yeah. this. Is what I mean by sac? Well, I was because I was thinking about this. So I was like, well, what would happen yeah. if I just said we're going to take six weeks off or two months off, uh, no batching, just yeah. like the shows on hiatus? There, I was like, okay, what does happen? Well, it's less money. Yeah, but I like this might be a fair trade though. No, I do like that because so the, I I it's tend a to signal do the to my thing. it's a signal as well to myself, right? Of like, hey, wait a second. I, this is so important to me to unwind. I'm willing to, we're giving up money to do this. Yeah. And then it becomes a brand signal. Like, <laughs> hey, I actually take the time. You know, there's a whole way to make it Well, I'm, I'm struggling with this right now. Like, this has, like, been a very, very crazy week for me. I think we did, like, eight interviews. And then I have a bunch next week. And, a, and then I have meetings. I have, all, I have a bunch of stuff. Are you ba- so you're batching ahead with interviews? No, I didn't think I was. But yeah. I was like, why is this so crazy? And then I realized the reason it's so crazy, first off, it's, it's something that's outside of my control, which is, it's South by Southwest in in, yeah. in Austin, so a bunch of people are yeah. here, right. so that like they were just like this is the only time they can do it in person. But then I realized the, really what's happening is I'm going out of town for like ten days for my kids' spring break. So what happened is I took ten days off the calendar, yeah. so it just moved that it stuff just, yep. this way or that way. Yep. And so so you yeah you or or like we we went out of town for a month this summer and it was great. But then I was like, why was it not as relaxing as I thought it would be? And it's because I didn't just continue on with my normal schedule and then there was a month gap and then I continued on with my normal schedule. Yeah. It was all the things that had to happen while I was not doing the things for a month basically just made the preceding month and the uh, proceeding yeah. month m- more stressful than it needed to be. And it might've been a wash, right? And yeah. so, so yeah, the idea of like, yep. no, 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 no. Like I... I, it's more like the rapture. Like I just go to the thing and then I disappear and yeah. then maybe I'll come back. That, it, so that's that's real. I'm inventing this term now, but real seasonality versus fake su- seasonality. Yes. It's fake seasonality if during this period I'm doing less work, but that all work that work all still got done. Yes, we just moved it or whatever. <laughs> real seasonality is we know Ryan disappears like for this month. Yeah, like can't go that, outside. It's raining. That's reason real seasonality. We've known that for a year in advance. Yeah, like just we've been as yeah. we've been booking the schedule. Yeah. We just you know book yeah. around it. Yeah, you know, I figured this out with as an academic. So if you had a research institution as a professor. The university does not pay your salary in the summer. Mm. They pay you ten months' salary. Yeah, like your contract. But can you pick your paychecks to like? You my could. mom was a teacher. They could be. They were like, "Do you want twelve months of paychecks or do you want ten months of paychecks?" But well, it's the same salary. So, so no one does that because what you do instead, if you're a researcher, is you you put in uh, what's called summer salary into your research grants. Uh, so you fill in those two months. Now it's like the National Science Foundation right, or DARPA is sure. paying it uh, because you're like, "Yeah, I'm, I should be yeah. working on research in the summer." Um, and so that's what people do, yeah. right? So now you're taking your your summer salary comes in, you know, from a grant or something yeah. like this. And then what people think is like, okay, but I still want to take vacations or this or yeah. that. But I am on the hook to keep working. Yeah. So they have to do fake seasonality, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then at some point I figured out, you don't have to do that. Yeah. Like, what if you just say, I'm not taking summer salary from a grant? As far as the university is concerned, you're not their employee in those two months. Like, there yeah. can't, you don't, yeah, yeah. there's nothing for you to you do. do they can't yeah. ask you to do anything. Yeah. Like, you're gone or whatever. And I figured out at some point, like, oh, why not just, you know, I write books. Like, wouldn't that be a good use of part of a book advance is yeah, to, to cover them. the summer? Mm. And, like, this was a, and, and that was real seasonality versus fake. I was doing fake before, which yeah. is summers are more flexible uh, because I don't have to teach and we can go travel and like do things, but also like I'm all, uh, I'm, I'm working yeah. and I have to write these reports or this or that. When I went to real seasonality, like, no, I'm, I'm taking a sacrifice. I'm losing money, but I owe no one, nothing to no one during this time. It really changed the, the character. That's why I want to make the podcast be protected in the summer as well. Yeah. So it's just, we That's know smart. in it, we just know in advance, like I, it takes I, a couple I completely shut down. Yeah. I think your tricky part is going to be audiences are not seasonal. I, I mean, I you are on TV shows, right. And that you're like, whatever, yeah. but, but if, if a thing is more like a daily or a weekly habit, 
breaking that habit is hard. So yeah, but here's my thought on. I thought about that. Yeah. So this is why podcasting thinks okay. Yeah. Because podcasting doesn't. It's it's a push not pull, right? So yeah. like, why do I listen to like Cal's podcast? Like it, I like it, and yeah. I see it come up in my list of new yeah. episodes, and I listen yeah. to it. All right, you go away for six weeks. You know, it's not showing up in their list. You come back. It just shows up again. They're already subscribed to the show, right? And when it comes back again, like, oh yeah, I like listening to Cal's show, right? Like, it's it's sort not of. that hard for them to get the habit back. Uh, I mean, that's not whistle. how I, that's not how algorithms work, right? And because that's it, also but not it's how, podcasting. There's no algorithms in podcasting. Oh, there absolutely is. And there's also you're thinking the, YouTube. Maybe. No, no, no. There's definitely algorithms. So what gets suggested uh, oh. in your things? And uh, did your did your downloads take a hit earlier this year? Probably. as all shows did yeah so what happened is apple started oh, yeah, recalculating fall, how, right yeah how yeah. they how they calculate episodes so the point is even if it's not totally true now it's definitely going to become in the past is that like it's gonna when you stop listening to a thing that's a reinforcing habit algorithmically yeah. and then also when you do think so yeah. so i think i think the the <laughs> rain in my parade the, ryan the, the recurring <laughs> is great but or it, it is uh it anyways that I would say though the thing I struggle with, I wonder if you struggle with this too. The hard part, it, the decision to do seasonality. Like when we, I just, I was like, I'm gonna take a month, I'm just gonna hang out. Only thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write, you know, maybe an hour or so a day, just working on this project. Yeah. But, but that's as I love doing it. I'm only doing the things I love to do. But then, so I take this month off the calendar, and then, you know, my speaking agent calls a couple of weeks before, and he goes, Hey, you know, you got this. Uh, offer to do this talk in Boston, you know, the smack in the middle of it. You can be in and out in one day. And, uh, and I, I was like, you know what? I'm going to be like, str- I'm going to, I said, I'm not going to do anything. So I'm not going to do anything. And then, uh, you know, he's like, okay, I told him this. And then you they, they doubled the offer or whatever. Yeah. So it's now the most I've ever been offered yeah. to a thing. And I decided to, to stick with it, to not do it. But now I'm like going like, not only was I already paying for this vacation, but now this is the most expensive vacation that I've ever taken in my life. We could have, you know what I mean? We could have gone on like a round the world trip first class for what I, yeah. you know? So, yeah. so the, the decision to be seasonal, I think was, is it's easier when there's norms about it. When everyone leaves for the summer, when yeah. everyone uh, in, you know, Gilded Age New York gets in their trains and goes in different directions, yeah. that's easy. But then when you're the only one doing it, then you you are actually having to calculate what that thing is costing yeah. you. I mean, and that's very painful. It is. It is. I mean, I have this, my, my speaking agency knows this now. Yeah. I don't like to do things in the summer. Okay. I mean, I, I completely frustrate them. Yeah. Right. Because I think from their perspective is this is money on the table yeah. and it's like sure. really big money. And why not just, it's, you know, yeah. you can, we can it's get you in day, and yeah. out same day or yeah. it's like going overnight or whatever. But the unpolluted seasonality, I don't know. There's an advantage to that, right? Because there's the... Does signal. it take you a lot of discipline to enforce that? Or yes. for you, is it it's just socially kind of naturally? Difficult. It's socially difficult, especially with like agents. Be like, I'm not going to do it. Is it so, but so socially difficult is one thing. Is it difficult for you personally to like, would you rather do it? No, I don't uh, like doing things. Okay. Yeah. All I want to do, honestly, like what am I wired to do yeah. is to like be in a cabin or on the beach riding. Huh. And it, like what I would be optimal set for is like the once a year novelist. Yeah. Come back at the end of this year with a novel. That's also a great season. Yeah. Quality, sure. And we will, uh, we're going to leave you alone. Till, like novelists have this figured out. It's the, it's the only industry I can discover where it's, there's no expectation. In fact, the expectation is you do nothing else. Novelists don't start, uh, they don't podcast a lot. Like, I mean, they do sometimes. I would, I would they don't have biz. If you're John Grisham, like but they'll you're say talking it's completely about novelists fine. instead of when you're actually referring to like 10 novelists. Basically, the well, all literary novelists, right? So no, it, no, but it, not the. But you're referring to the industry as successful, if that's not novelist. like seven people who can who are at that level. Yeah, but but uh, but the thing is, like, if you let's say if you got to our level of success in novels, yeah, sure. okay, to make it comparable, okay. yeah, it would be completely understood you if we disappeared else. before publicity tours. Like that's a not everyone does it, but it's a complete. Like I wrote this article once looking at Crichton versus Grisham. Because mm-hmm. they were doing similar types yeah. of novels, and Crichton went like the maximalist route. Yeah, he, I want to do TV, I want to do scripts, I want to direct. I moved to Hollywood, and Grisham went the other way. This is yeah. great. I can quit my job, I can disappear. I'll do three weeks of publicity a year. Yeah. I don't have, a, I don't even have a team. Yeah, he had like one assistant, mm-hmm. and then she I did re- marketing for one of his books. Yeah, and then when yeah. she retired, he yeah. was like. I don't need anyone else yeah, because yeah. only my agent and my editor ever call me and they call me like this time of year when I tell them what I'm writing, right? Yeah. Uh, and he went that way with it. And that's compl- and people are like, that's fine. Yeah. Like it's completely fine, right? It's the only, where if you or I 
said like, okay, I'll be back in two years with my book. Like, you don't, it just doesn't happen as much in nonfiction and certainly not in like a lot of other jobs as well, yeah. but there it's normalized because there's this, uh, this belief that came from literary novelist of this is not going to be good enough to win the award. If anything pollutes me, this is like Dave mm -hmm. Edgar's writes on the, the non-internet connected laptop and disappears. And, um, it's because it came out of that belief of you can't create this art. And if it's not art, then it's not going to, if it's not great and doesn't get the national book award, then why did we pay so much for Jonathan right. Franzen's latest right, book? Right, right, right. And so they had this idea of like, yeah, please just disappear and do what you do. But oh, very few fields have normalized that. Yes, that's right. But I think at the, what they all have in common ultimately is to, to be able to pull any of that off is leverage, which you talk about in So Good, you, can't ignore. you have to have yeah. leverage. Like you have, you have to have the goods, you have to have the audience. You have to you write have the, the firm. Confidence. Yeah, yeah. And, and and you have to, uh, and so, yeah, whether you're a salesman who wants to be the only remote employee for your company, yeah. or you want to be the author who takes a bunch of, uh, you know, weeks off during the year, months off during the year, or, you know, whatever it is, yeah. you gotta, you, no one's gonna give it to you. Yes. You have to take it. Yes. And demand it, and then, you have to have the leverage to be able to make it worth doing. That's why That's why I say uh, the obsession over quality piece of slow productivity is the glue Yeah. because it gives you two different things that both reinforce slowness. So like one, uh, as we talked about, as you obsess more about quality, slowness by which we're saying here like lack of busyness yeah. becomes like really natural, right? So like once you get more obsessed with doing something really well, the more all the other stuff begins to feel almost like morally bankrupt. Yeah, like yeah, you, yeah. you just instinctually want to have less busyness. And then the second piece is as you do something really well, you get the leverage. Yeah. You get the leverage to be able to actually uh, demand and get slowness. And that's why the story I thought captured both sides of that in the book was the, the singer Jewel. Yes. Because I said she did both, right? Yeah. So when she was coming up, she was this weird, really talented singer because she had grown up, you know, yodeling with her family troupe in rural yeah. Alaska and had this weird vocal control and then went to uh, this interlock in, which is like this, this really good art school in, in Michigan. So she had like she had the goods, uh, but she was singing at a coffee shop, leaving out of her car or whatever. Yeah. And these record executives discovered her. Like, yeah. She is very, very good. Um, so they go to sign her and they put a million dollars on the table eventually. Right. Yeah. And she turns down the signing bonus because, you know, she's like going to bring up the story when you're talking yeah. about talking to that agent when you're a kid. Yeah. Yeah. So she turns down the, the, the million dollar signing bonus because she, she's like, this is going to it's going to take me time to figure out how to translate this into uh, like a fully established singer songwriter who can make a lot of uh, records. And if they give me a million dollar bonus, they're going to want to make that back, which yeah. means I have to have a hit record in the first like whatever many months and I'm not going to. And she did it like the pieces of me at first wasn't working. Right. So she, she, uh, her, her desire to be really good. She said, I'm going to choose a slower trajectory in the music. Yeah. No big signing bonus. This will give me a multi-year runway. Yeah. And then she was very, I'm going to be very cheap for you, right? No tour bus. I'm going to drive my own car. Yeah. Like I'm going to cost you nothing. Um, because her desire to be really good meant she's like, I have to slow down. Yeah. Then once she got really good, she went on one of those Taylor Swift style international tours, um, started doing Hollywood stuff. She was in an Ang Lee movie. All of her people yeah. were saying, this is this is, it's, this is the plan. Yeah. We're going to move to Hollywood. Yeah. We're going to do movies in between international tours. She's like, well, wait a second. I have a lot music? of money yeah. and I'm really good. Yeah. And she said, no tour. Never did another international tour. Wow. Never did another movie. Went to uh, Texas, actually. Yeah. She came to, she was, uh, her boyfriend at the time was a rodeo writer. Huh. Came out to his ranch in Texas. She's like, I want to just write music and do albums. And like, I don't, uh, so, the quest for quality slowed her down. She turned yeah. down the million dollars, went on to make more than 200 million after that. We know that because her mom stole $200 million from her. So that's a whole other story. Uh, and then she used, once she did get good, yeah, she used that to slow down her life too. So you get this sort of like double-edged virtue right. for obsessing over quality. Yeah, I feel like, so on the one hand, I was very unlucky in that The Obstacles Away, which is sold a, a very large amount of copies. I only got a small advance for it. Like, as we were saying, my publisher thought it was a crazy idea. Yeah. My first marketing book had come out. I got in a big advance and it had done okay, but they, I got less than half for that book, for a book that ultimately sold millions of copies. So one argument would be I should have gotten a much higher advance, right? But since they didn't really believe in it, but I did, I took the smaller advance, but when it came out, it did okay. You know, They were like, sure, you wanna do another one? And I did another one. And so now I'm three or four books in with the same publisher. We have a long-standing relationship. 
I'm not going anywhere. They're not going anywhere. The book's able to develop. I'm able to sell all my books. That, so, so I've been able to yeah. do which, which, uh, I mean, what are you at four with portfolio five? Um, how many have you done there? That's a good question. It was minimalism emails. My third with them. Yeah. So you're, which is unusual in and of itself. I've done 12, 13. Yeah. Um, nobody does that in publishing because yeah. you're always, you're always chasing the next deal, which you think is you cashing in your leverage. Yeah. But actually someone else is getting leverage over you Yeah. because they're not giving you a large advance because you're awesome. They're giving you a large advance because they think they're going to make it back. And as soon as they give it to you, they want to start making it back. Yeah. And so, so yeah, sometimes the thing that feels like financially actually wasn't a great move is from a lifestyle and a freedom and a development standpoint, absolutely the right thing to yeah. do. And then in the end, the same financially. Well, you're, you're the, I mean, I always point to your example for this. Like you're the person I know most who says, who cares about the advance? Yeah. Like it's, it's just a loan on, uh, basically on earnings. If you're going you're gonna to make the same money regardless. Yeah. yeah. And I've gone back and forth on it. A like, I do I, too. Like the, I definitely don't try to get smaller advances. I think but. it doesn't like the thing, the thing that does matter though, I learned is it also dictates the uh, energy they put into a book. So I, I began agree. seeing the advances a little bit as a, as a scorecard. Like if they spend this much, then their marketing budget is X. And if it's this much, but I think that's starting to get in the weeds a little bit, right? Yeah, like, yeah. But like, the point is if she had taken a million dollar advance, she wouldn't have been able to have a, a one album that did okay and then do another album. Yeah. They'd be like, they, they're they already writing her off on they're their books. Off. Exactly. And, and so the fact that the obstacles, I mean, the obstacles away so. 36, 3,700 copies its first week, yeah. which is not terrible, yeah. but it wouldn't have predicted where it ended up. Yeah. But they didn't cut bait on it because for what they'd given the advance on, they're like, eh, this is okay. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It, managing uh, managing expectations is yeah. an important well, part of it too. Deep Work was the same way, yeah. you know. Deep Work, so the book before Deep Work, So Good They Can't Ignore You, didn't live up to their expe uh, expectations at first. Huh. Reduced the advance yeah for deep work sure but then and, and i was like succeeded. i was like oh, i guess fair enough yeah. right and yeah. so like let's just do this like let's just yeah let's just roll like i i think this book is good like let's get that going and then when deep work was first coming out because it was a lower advance you know they weren't doing a ton they were doing yeah. like what was reason there was nothing bad happening here they were yeah. doing what was reasonable yeah. for that level and i i was complaining i still remember this call to my agent i was like nothing's happening with this book my friends like parents went to Barnes and Noble. They didn't even have it in stock. Like this is yeah. a great idea. And she's like, they don't, they don't budget money based on ideas. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's, they, it's, work, they have a model. Do? Yeah. What can it yeah. do? And she's like, look, you gotta just do the work. And so like, I was like, okay, great. That so touched me. I was like, I'm just going to um, put my head down and like keep trying to get better. And so then I started doing, I mean, I got yeah. my, my writing for my newsletter and then podcast emerged as a thing. And I was like doing all the podcast, just doing podcasts, really podcasts. And that and, book and also it, millions and, of copies later. And then you're saying it, it was so good that they couldn't ignore it. It was so good they couldn't ignore yeah. it. And, uh, and ironically, Deep Work Doing Well pulled So Good They Can't Ignore You up to be like a, a very good seller. None of those books were bestsellers though. That's funny. Yeah.